It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Monday, January 8th, 2024. Hello again, everyone. I sure hope you're doing well. Welcome back to the program. It is so great to be here on a frigid Monday afternoon in New York City. A snowy weekend has come and gone, and what a weekend it is. I got to be honest with all of you, uh, maybe... I don't know, three and a half hours of sleep. You know, when you're overtired, you sort of feel a little bit, uh, I don't know, high, like you're flying. Delirious. Yeah, delirious. You're floating. It's a good type of, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're overtired, when you're battling sleep deprivation for good reasons, it's kind of a fun feeling. And I got to be honest, I couldn't go to sleep last night. I was too busy celebrating my beloved Buffalo Bills who pulled Bills. it out in Miami what a time it was, what a game it was. I have to say I was sweating. I was nervous, but they pulled it out. Four-time AFC East champion, back to back to back to back, and now we're back home in Pittsburgh. So that was a great way to sort of end the weekend. But the way the weekend started for me was, you know, I was kind of wrapping things up, getting ready for Shabbos dinner, and then all of a sudden I get the call from Mr. Turkey al Sheikh. His Excellency, about the big fight coming up in uh, in March, Francis Ngannou versus Anthony Joshua. We break that news at around, I don't know, 4.20 or something like that, and then everything explodes. Last time I checked, the tweet had about uh, 10 or so million views. Uh, couldn't help but notice that no one in the boxing media credited us, which is fine, you know, which is fine. There's a little... You know, there's a little territorial thing going on, like what the hell is this MMA guy doing breaking news of this stature? But make no mistake about it, my friends, it is happening. Francis Ngannou, who around a year ago, almost exactly to the day, departed the UFC. Then, of course, in May, signs with PFL, then gets the Tyson fight in July, then fights Tyson in October, and then waits to see how the cookie crumbles in December, gets the big AJ fight, and it's going down in March. I have a lot of thoughts on this fight, why it feels bigger, why it feels more important, why it feels like more people are excited about this one than the Tyson fight. We're going to get into all of that and more on today's program. Saturday was relatively quiet. Uh, There was one boxing event on DAZN, Virgil Ortiz, with the very controversial stoppage victory. Uh, Tony Weeks jumped in there in the first round. It was bizarre. And then uh, Sunday, we were, you know, our stomach was in knots due to the Bills game. Thank you very much to the Jags. Uh, Excuse me for losing. Uh, Thank you to the Titans for winning. Uh, Sorry about your luck, Jaguars. My heart breaks. (laughs) Then watch the Bills game. Then I'm about to go to bed, and all of a sudden, Dana drops two pretty massive pieces of news. Uh, The first one being UFC 299, which didn't really have to get bigger and better, has now gotten bigger and better. Uh, UFC 299 uh, now is, according to Dana White, going to feature a five-round co-main event fight between Dustin Poirier, El Diamante, and Benoit Saint-Denis. What a fight. And then he also added that UFC 300 is going to feature a a very important number one contender fight, as he put it, between Charles Oliveira and Armin Sarukian. He said the winner would fight for the belt. He didn't really clarify if Islam Makhachev's next fight will be against Justin Gaethje now that Charles Oliveira is fighting Armin Sarukian or if the winner of this fight is, in fact, going to be the next guy to fight Islam Makhachev. He did say Islam Makhachev a little bit banged up um, and that he would return sometime later this year. Uh, one hopes that it's not in October again in Abu Dhabi because then we're getting into a groove where it's literally once a year in Abu Dhabi that he's fighting. So we hope that that's not the case. But let's see. I knew that he wouldn't fight at 300 because of Ramadan. Um, probably wasn't going to fight in Saudi Arabia, although there was a possibility of that. But uh, Dana said that he's banged up. So those are two big fights. Now, I say we 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 uh, 
you know, kind of assume that those are official because let's be honest, a lot of these fights gets announced, get announced, and they're not quite official. So let's see how those cookie crumble. But uh, let's be honest, those are two amazing fights and you got to give props to Poirier and Oliveira. They could have, you know, made the case for fighting each other uh, as opposed to two up and coming, hungry, dangerous, violent studs. And they're fighting those guys instead. Um, two really tough fights, two really, really, really interesting fights, old guard versus new guard. I love it. In a division that needs some refreshing, in a division that needs to introduce some new blood where there is a ton of new blood knocking at the door, uh, hopefully we start to see more of this in other weight classes. So we're going to talk about all of that and more on today's program. What a show. We're back to the old format. Obviously, Wednesday we had the award show. Hope you all loved that as much as we loved putting it on. Appreciate all the feedback and uh, everyone who weighed in, good, bad, indifferent. Uh, but now we get back to what we do best, and that is the interview program. As always, we are presented by our good friends over at DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Check out what DraftKings has to offer this season with the code the MMAR because life's more fun when you're in on the action. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem call 100 gambler age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. Hopefully, uh, after the uh, the Bills lost to the Eagles in November, you slammed them to win the AFC East. I wonder what the odds were back then. And then, of course, they've now won uh, five in a row. And what a time it is to be alive. Oh, my God. You know yourself. Frank and I were texting back and forth all night about it. Are you still on a high, too, Frank? Actually, yes, I am very much still on a high. When someone says actually like that, you kind of don't believe them. Oh, well, that's weird. You should take people at their face value. Uh, back end of the show, we'll talk to the guys about the uh, AJ Francis fight. Prior to that, we'll speak to Eddie Hearn, who, of course, uh, we spoke about AJ Francis after the Francis Tyson fight. Uh, head man over at Matchroom, his guy gets the fight, and it will be later on this year. Uh, there are reports about the date, March 8th. That's what I'm hearing as well. They're going to officially announce it all on January 15th, which is next Monday at a press conference in London. So stay tuned. For that part of that, Alexander Rakic is going to join us. He returns to action at UFC 300. Uh, that is an interesting fight, a big fight at 205 against Yuri Prochaska, the former light heavyweight champion. Speaking of UFC 300, which is starting to take shape, Bo Nickel is going to be on that card against Cody Brundage. Big showcase fight for him. Ian Gary will not be on that card. He'll be fighting on February 17th at UFC 298. It was initially announced as 299. Uh, now 298 against Jeff Neal. Of course, he was supposed to fight in December, on December 15th to be exact. Got the pneumonia, and uh, he's feeling better, but had to pull out of that fight against Vicente Luque. Why isn't he fighting Luque? We'll ask Ian about that and what was a somewhat tumultuous back end of the year for him. And in a matter of moments, we're going to be joined from Paris, live from Paris, site of the 2024 Summer Olympic Games by the talk of the combat sports world. And you have to say combat sports world because it's not just MMA and it's not just boxing. It's both Francis and Ganu. I love the fact that he got this fight. I love the fact that he didn't take a step back. As some people said, all right, you had a great showing against Tyson. Now go fight Dillian White. Now go fight Derek Chisora. Now go fight Jile Zhang, who's no, you know, walk in the park or a Joseph Parker or a Joe Joyce. No, he's going from Tyson Fury to Anthony Joshua. And and look, I'm not going to do the whole receipt thing. I'm not going to do the victory lap thing. That's done. We now have to move on from that. And that's why moral victories don't count. Now you are a pro boxer. Now you're very much in the mix. You are ranked in the WBC. You can't, moral victories don't count. Last year was last year. Spiking the football doesn't count. I'm not even going to go through, the, I'm not going through the whole thing anymore. Now we're in a boxing career. And look, you got to give him an immense amount of credit. He is taking the toughest fights possible. He is fighting the, you know, arguably two of the top three most dominant heavyweights of the past decade. He's not shying away. He's doing everything that he said he wanted to do. It's incredible. And this one actually, to me, feels bigger than the Tyson Fury fight because the Tyson Fury fight I, very much in the UK was was criticized, was called the sham, was called you know a, a money grab, all this stuff and more. What is he doing fighting this guy? He can't hit mitts. He's slow. 
He has no idea what he's doing. He has no technique. This one feels bigger because of what we saw on October 28th. Now it feels like people are taking him seriously. I, I look at the the reaction. There was some talk of Joshua fighting Hergovich. Yeah, sure. Makes sense in the rankings and whatnot. This is infinitely bigger. This is infinitely bigger than Jile Zhang. And it's infinitely bigger not only because of Francis, but also because of AJ. AJ came back after a really poor 2022 and uh, you know losing to Usyk twice and then uh, in the span of like a year or so. And then he comes back and wins three fights. Now I know, you know, Hellenius, Franklin aren't the biggest names, but he looked solid, gets the stoppage, gets the knockout in the second fight, and then gets a huge win over Otto Valin, a very dominant win. Because of how good he looked, especially at the end of the year, this fight feels bigger. It doesn't feel like AJ on the back nine. It feels like the return of AJ. It feels like AJ has found something with Ben Davison, who I think is one of the best trainers in the sport, who helped rejuvenate Tyson's career. And I think it was always a big mistake that Tyson left him. Now they're together, and now people want to see, can he do to Francis what Tyson couldn't do? Anything Tyson could do, he says he could do better. And he wins this fight, and Tyson wins this fight. We could very much be in line for this mega fight that we've been dreaming about since 2012, right? Tyson versus Joshua, or a little bit after the Olympics. So it feels bigger for all those reasons, because we now respect, well, at least the outside world. We always did here. But the outside world and especially the boxing world, respects Francis because of how good Anthony Joshua looked. Because, you know, we saw what happened in October. We saw what happened in December. It feels bigger. And I love the fact that it's against it's against AJ and it's against Eddie Hearn, who were two of the, the loudest skeptics when it came to this fight, calling it a gimmick fight, calling it a sham of a fight, saying that he wanted to fight top-ranked guys. Now he gets to shut those guys up. Oh, how can you not be excited for all of this? How can you not be excited about all of this? And if you're an MMA fan, how could you not be happy for Francis? And how could you not say that, hey, Francis is injecting a little bit of MMA into boxing right now? Because look, when, when Brock Lesnar comes over to the UFC, he fights Heath Herring and he fights Frank Mir and he fights Randy Couture. You know what I mean? When, when, when there, it, there are no gimme fights, you don't get 20 in a row when you're an MMA prospect, even like a Bo Nickel goes straight into the UFC and Ian Gary goes, you know, a couple fights into cage warriors. He goes into the UFC in boxing. Here's this novice, as they call them, a debutante, France and gun who's fighting Tyson and AJ. He, he's taking an MMA approach an MMA mindset. And let's be honest, a UFC mindset into the world of boxing and everyone in the boxing world is like, damn, this guy is actually putting his money where his mouth is. He's actually going after the big fights. I, f- I feel like in doing so, he's putting a little bit of pressure on everyone else to step their game up. And the best thing to happen to Francis since leaving the UFC was obviously his, his relationship with Saudi Arabia. They have endless pockets, and they want to make these fights happen. They like him very much. They're making these fights happen. And so here we are. He wins this fight. How does he not fight the winner of Usyk and Fury? He loses this fight. How does AJ not fight the winner of Usyk Fury? So it it ties AJ to Fury, which is what we all wanted from the beginning. It ties him to that February 17th fight. He's now very much in line. Um, They'll they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll make it happen if he wins. And uh, if Francis wins, how and, and, and especially if Tyson wins, how do you not give him another crack at Tyson Fury? And if Usyk wins, maybe you run it back with the... with Tyson, but he's very much in the mix. Now, the big question is, what happens to Francis as far as his PFL career is concerned? I asked the PFL about this. They're very confident that he will fight for them uh, this coming year. I still maintain for now that this is all good for them. Uh, They've got some big plans of their own next month, which should come out very soon. Uh, Don Davis is teasing this on Twitter. Anytime someone talks about Francis right now, they talk about PFL, which I think is uh, is good for the brand. And I'm sure they want him to fight eventually. And so let's see what happens there. But it's crazy that on Wednesday we were talking about, you know, what's the biggest story of the year and what was the biggest story of last year? My biggest story of last year was Francis. My biggest story to watch over the next 12 months is Saudi Arabia. And now here on the first Friday of 2024, the two come together to give us this massive piece of news. Francis Ngannou versus Anthony Joshua later on this year 
in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Ten rounds, by the way. Uh, real fight, real rules, not an exhibition. We'll count on the record, all that and more. And there's rumors about other big names on the card. Once again, uh, is it going to be Deontay Wilder and uh, Gilles Zhang? Is it going to be some of the names that we saw back on December 23rd? Uh, that is all TBD. I suspect we'll learn more over the coming week. And then, of course, that press conference. And what a sight that's going to be, right? Uh, two, I mean, just behemoths chiseled. AJ, who it does feel like there's this newfound excitement surrounding his career and where he's at right now. And uh, Francis, who's just an absolute buzzsaw and, and, and an inspiration and the talk of the town. Those two guys, that face-off next Monday is uh, is going to be amazing. The first one. I can't wait for the scene. So in a matter of moments, uh, we are hopefully going to be joined live from France by Le Predateur himself, Francis Ngannou. And uh, later on in the program, we're going to be joined uh, by Eddie Hearn, who's in the midst of one of these crazy fast that everyone is doing these days. I heard even Frank was considering one of these fasts. Is that right? That's actually right. Uh, how many hours are you into it? Um, 12. Okay, perfect. So uh, I think I think Eddie is like 70 hours into his fast, and I did check in with him once again and say, hey, uh, you going to be good to come on the show? And he assured me that he will be, in fact, good to uh, come on the show in the midst of the fast which is uh, quite impressive. I don't know why everyone's doing this, bone broth, water fast, this, that, and the other. Uh, Nevertheless, perhaps they are all aspiring to have a physique like this. Anyway, I can't wait for that conversation because, as you recall, we were debating last time he was on, or two times ago, about, you know, he said that AJ would smoke, Francis. I was like, you're out of your mind. And now here we are, my friends. It is actually happening. Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou. Without further ado, let us speak to the most talked about man in combat sports today, the richest prize in combat sports today, Le Predateur, Francis Ngannou. Ah, there he is. Hey, how are you? <laughs> hey, Francis, how are you? I'm good, and you? Uh, bonne année à tous et à toutes. Bonne année, bonne année. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Best of wishes for you guys. My bon année is starting off pretty good. Yes. Okay. So let's get into that, my friend. Uh, can I ask, how did this all come together? Because I, I, I thought maybe you would be in Riyadh on December 23rd just to take a look at the competition. And obviously we had heard rumors that Wilder and Joshua had a deal. Wilder loses to Parker. Is that when you stepped in? Yes, that when I step in. When I watched those fights, I watched the uh, uh, Wilder uh, fight and then... Um, after that, I watched the uh, Joshua fight, and I'm like, there's an opportunity here. Okay. So uh, I make a tweet first, yeah, and then receive a call. <laughs> Who calls you? Just ask. Uh, Who calls you then? Oh, man, I receive a lot of call. <laughs> and Dr. Rakan, Dr. Rakan reached out, and uh, the minister reached out. Okay. Uh, was it a hard deal to put together? No, absolutely not. The easier deal. Really? E- easier than Tyson? Yeah. Easier. Because, like, you know, the Tyson the Tyson one, we were just, like, there was also, like, a uh, temperature type of things. You know, nobody really knows, like, okay, what's going to happen? Um, you have to, like, negotiate, try to, negotiate about everything, the room, the flight. I mean, we didn't even have to do all, all those stuff, but the way that they came out to the fight, rode the red carpet. So this time around, didn't even have to because they did the great, amazing job last time, even though it wasn't bound in the contract. So a lot of things was just like smooth and moving up like, like this. You know, stuff that we used to fight for, like, oh, I want one more room, I want this, was over. Easy. You didn't have to deal with that. Easy. Easy. Can, can, now, now, taking a step back, can I ask, what has life been like for you? So the last time we spoke was right after the uh, the fight on October 30th. Can you describe what yes. life has been like for you and how much it has changed since that fight? 
How much the change? I know what change is that um, I personally are very exciting. You know, even when I'm not, uh, even before I had a fight, I um, I really train and picture uh, picture myself in the ring, in the situation. You know, like trying to improve, get excited about that. You know, enjoy it. Um, like even today, I did my first sparring. Uh, out here in Paris, uh, I did my first sparring with Guido, the Italian guy, and uh, six round, pretty good. And uh, even John was like, "Oh, you're more comfortable now," even though it was my first sparring. Like, even my mindset, you know, at some point you kind of like believe that okay, I might not be great, I might not be good yet, but I can do this. You know, all this question that. Uh, you had during the other training camp. Oh man, would I be able to do this? Can I go ten round? Can I this? I know I can do, and I can even push for more. I can, you know. It's been amazing. I've been feeling really great. Do Do you feel like you are getting more love and respect around the world? Are more people recognizing you? Are more opportunities coming oh. your way? Oh, absolutely! Like completely uh, different than before. Like this fight. Uh, I can tell he changed everything. Like even in Cameroon, I used to go out sometime uh, and then I would have a crowd. And last time I went out, I had to run because <laughs> I almost get mobbed. Like I I, I jump in on uh, behind of the bicycle and like run, run, run because I couldn't handle anymore. And you just understand that is a different level. It's, yeah, it's different level. A lot of people um, show compassion, a lot show support, uh, because so far everybody believes that uh, believes that I won that fight. So, and then they feel like this uh, injustice, and they're like, ah, you know, they stand by your side for that. Uh, before Usyk Fury was announced, was there any talk of running it back right away between you and Fury? He has always been around. Uh, talk about that. Always. I mean, even after the fight, uh, the minister stepped in the octagon and he said, get ready for the rematch. So why didn't it happen? Yeah. No, it's going to happen. I mean, there's a, there's a fury and music. Okay. Even uh, then we, we, we spoke about it. You know, there's a fury and music going on. So this was like an opportunity. I was waiting for fury, but this was the opportunity that I was happy to take. I asked for you know, and at the end of the day, this won't take anything from the uh, Fury rematch. Okay. So I, I was just wondering if there was any talk of doing it right away, like before Usyk. No, no, he has never been right away. Okay. I think there's even a, there's even a slight chance that the right away is the Usyk rematch. Oh. Because I think, yeah, I think they have like a uh, days, their, their term is even closer. Our term was, uh, our rematch term was in one year within one year, which is still going to be in October uh, next year. Right. I mean, October this year. So, If if they would have done Wilder Joshua, if Wilder would have won on December 23rd and uh, Joshua obviously won as well, what do you think your next move would have been? I don't know. As, at that point, I was my next move for sure was Fury. Uh, end of the year. That was my next move for sure. This one just happened to be an opportunity, and I was ready for the opportunity. I won. I slide in, you know. <laughs> so you would have waited? You yeah. just would have waited until next? You would have not fought anyone until you fought him again? No. Like, I sh I mean, that was what I had for sure. Some speculation about some stuff that wasn't sure, but I had the Fury one luck for sure. But now I have two fights luck for this year okay so obviously as you know there's a lot of people wondering about your mma future and in particular your relationship with pfl how does this affect your pfl plans and mma plans for 2024 it doesn't affect at all because um first of all like when i receive a uh, call and a offer for proposal for this fight uh what happened i reach out to pfl and you know tell them because we have we are we are in the business together, you know. And I get they gave me their blessing for the opportunity. They said we can take 
this kind of op opportunity out of you. So I was happy to do that. You know, I didn't want to know what us they want to say as long as they approve. They didn't have any problem with this. <laughs> uh, is there a strong possibility that you will fight in MMA this year? Strong possibility, possibility, yes. Strong, I don't know. As I said, even before this fight, nothing was certain yet. Okay. Okay, so there's a chance you just fight in boxing twice. There's a chance. Okay. And uh, there was some talk of like a mixed rules fight with uh, you and Deontay Wilder. Was that ever real? Yes, he was real. And and what but, happened? Uh, well, um, then Deontay Wilder had a fight. Yeah. First, uh, then that uh, stepped on the way, and then I think now I have a fight. I said I said earlier that it feels to me like this one is bigger than the Fury fight because now the boxing community. They all respect you more, and they know what you did. They saw what you did. And because AJ looked so good last year, especially in his last fight against Otto Valin, it feels like everyone's treating this not like, oh, sideshow circus. Like, this is a real heavyweight contender fight. I feel the buzz is a lot more positive and a lot more, you know, excitement surrounding it. Are you feeling the same as opposed to when the Fury fight was first announced? Yes. I, um... I, I, I felt that, and you can even see the odds, even though I'm on the on uh, on the dock, it's not ridiculous as the last time. <laughs> you know, you, you can tell that they, they they are giving me showing me some respect. Like, okay, don't count this guy out. And I know you never really like believed or talked about moral victories, but I I also feel like now it's not like now fighting a close fight, knocking him down, isn't enough anymore. Uh, now you're in the mix. You're 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 fighting contenders. You're fighting the best of the best. Now you want to like actually have a run in boxing. It's no longer to prove a point. Now you actually want to you know go on a run here. Is that is that a fair assessment of where you're at? Yeah, it always has been. I always said I want a couple fight. I don't want a one shot thing in boxing. Always. I never said I want like one fight to prove this. You can prove nothing in one fight. You can go out there look good for one fight or look bad. That doesn't mean anything. You know, so, um, and even for myself, uh, I really want to prove, you know, to improve, to learn, to see what could be my limit, what's, what exactly my limit, what I can possibly do. I think it would be a shame to end up without really like, uh, or to retire re without really like reach my limit, my full potential. Uh, without getting into specifics, it feels like the business of Francis Ngannou, as we said earlier, is booming. Uh, are, are you getting even more for this fight than you got for the Fury fight? <laughs> Come on, my friend. Don't, don't expose me. Don't expose me. What you're doing, you're calling them after me. You're sending them after me, and they will come after me. Who? It's not good for business. Who? who who's that? No. Huh? Who do you... No, no, it's not, good for, it's not good for business. Okay, fair enough. I just... But I'm, I'm taking... You just make sure I'm being taken care of. I, I I know that you are. I know that you are. So don't you worry. Don't you worry. Fair enough. Are you getting a lot of <laughs> MMA fighters reaching out to you? And because uh, I feel like they're all looking at you and being like, "Shit!" Like every single one of them, you're actually doing it. Yeah, reaching. I'm receiving a lot of support of those who that we are in contact, those who, that I meet, uh, those that I know. I'm receiving a lot of support and a lot of praise from them, uh, which is quite amazing, which still proved that I didn't, I wasn't wrong. I was right doing what I was doing. You know, it's amazing. We're almost approaching a year since your official departure from the UFC. Is, is this now exceeding your expectations? Like, this is almost like too perfect how this is all playing out. Is it even going better than you could have even dreamed of? Well, I'm a dreamer. You know, um, and a dream doesn't have a limit. I mean, this is this being great. Um, I wasn't expecting this, but as far as dreaming, I was dreaming even for, more for this. Dream is free. Why don't I dream for for the sky? Mm. <laughs> and and you were certainly... so I have dream for more. Okay, I love it. Uh, did you watch? So you watched AJ. What did you think of AJ in December and really his whole year? He had three wins. 
And it looked like he got better every time out. Well, he looked amazing. He looked amazing. I mean, respect to him. Congratulations to him. Um, he was doing his job properly. His speed was there, everything. He was sharp, very sharp. But I did, on the other hand, I think there wasn't a response in front of him. I mean, I mean, I think I will have a better response in front of him that will put him not in such comfortable situation, position. So things will change. Things will be different. I will not stay there and just look at him. Mm. You know, no, it's different. It's going to be different. When I'm going to, I'm going to throw some bombs out there. It's, when you deal with, I think he's going to be mindful of what he's doing. But this time you can't really sneak up on people, right? Like I think against Fury, no one knew that you had these skills, but now one suspects that he'll be more ready than, or at least take you more seriously than Fury, right? Do you feel that way? Yeah. Yeah, but no, no, no one still know what I, no, no, no one still know what I can do. That was my first fight in boxing. Mm -hmm. That was my first fight. And then uh, as anyone, I'm just improving. And the gap of improvement from a beginner like me is huge. So I'm just a beginner improving. So huge gap of improvement. So, yes. Are you going to be training with the same coaches that helped you prepare for Fury? That's the idea. Um, I have reached out to everyone. I'm not, I'm going to uh, have my train. I'm in Paris right now. We're going to do some uh, filming in Europe and the press conference in London. And then after that, I go straight to Saudi. So I have reached out to my team. And then uh, for whomever is available, we move to Saudi. Okay. Now, um, you know who Eddie Hearn is, right? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I had <laughs> I had him on my show uh, the Monday after your fight. Uh, I don't know if you saw his comments. You know, both he and, and AJ were a little bit dismissive of your skills going into the Fury fight. They gave you more props on the back end. But can I play you his comments about a potential at the time, you versus Anthony Joshua fight, and get your response? Okay. Okay, here's Eddie Hearn back in October. Francis Ngannou against Anthony Joshua is one of the biggest fights in the history of the sport. And I promise you this, respect to Francis, easy work for my man. And I know, I know, Ariel, I know you're getting a little bit high right now. I know the MMA world are just walking in the clouds, but we'll bring it straight back down to reality. You can't tell me here for a second Ariel. that he's not going to smoke him. You know that. No, but that's what I want. No, I want you to sell me the fight, he's, Ariel. He's not going to smoke him. You tell me Francis Ngannou can beat Anthony Joshua. And Ngannou lands that punch that he landed in the third round. I don't know if AJ gets off the mat. No, Ariel. You're crazy. So you think Ngannou will beat Joshua? Not only do I think Ngannou can beat Joshua, <laughs> I think you're being incredible. You're doing the same thing that you did. I love it. Uh, I love it. Actually, what's no, it? No, but this is why. No, but all of a sudden, we've gone from a night that's farcical, right? Pre fight on Saturday. That, but that was, Many that was you was and AJ farcical. that said that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, you and not AJ. AJ. No, no, no. AJ no, said it was me. a gimmick fight. AJ said it was a gimmick fight. Yeah, he, yeah he's, well, I'm saying he wasn't interested in the gimmick fight when it was proposed to him. He's not, sure. you know, so, but. A lot of people's perception pre-fight Saturday was that that fight was farcical, right? We are now in a position where we're debating if Francis Ngannou beats Anthony Joshua. Take my money and I will show you what happens when Anthony Joshua fights Francis Ngannou. Easy money, Eddie says. You see that? What do you make of these comments, Francis? Well, Eddie is a promoter, so... That's like a routine for him, like a déjà vu. I mean, uh, it's just like he, he said the same thing all the time, just not about Francis Ngannou, but about somebody else. That's how he do. That's what he does. But um, man, the day is set. It's two months from now, and I I don't think uh, if he any of them think they are going to have an easy money. Well, too bad for them. Um, and uh, by the way. Answering that question, if uh, AJ take the the, uh, the punch that um, Fury took, me too. I don't guarantee that is going up. I have heard that he doesn't have a chin. I'm gonna fight down. <laughs> yes, the likes of Andy Ruiz uh, exposed that chin, right? 
I, I mean, I have heard so. So, do you, do you buy the theory that he's back? That the old AJ is back? That he was able to, you know, refine himself? Or do you think that uh, you know the Usyk fights really kind of exposed that he's he's not the same fighter that he once was? Um, I think I think he's still the same fighter. That doesn't mean he can lose. Mm. I mean, like being the same fighter doesn't mean you can lose, right? He lost to uh, uh, Angie Ruiz. He lost to um, uh, Yusek, Alessandro Yusek, and he can still lose. By the way, I'm really intending to hang him some loss on uh, on March 8th. So, like, yes, you can still be who you are, but still lose. Nobody is undefeated. By the way, speaking of that date, um, why is it on a Friday? Do you have any idea? Um, I think because uh, they have a uh, close show um, on a Saturday, which is probably the Formula One, I think, okay. I believe, uh, on Saturday. So that's why I make the fight on, sa- sa- on Friday and we couldn't move it on Saturday. So that's why it's a little confusing because even me at first, I'm like the ninth. Right. So then they keep saying the eighth for certain, for that reason, okay. probably. But we have to, we, we're still going to find out. Uh, do you think if you win this fight, you will fight for the heavyweight title? Like, do you think you'll fight the winner of Fury Usyk? You know, even if they rematch, like, could you conceivably win this fight and then fight for the heavyweight championship? I win this fight, I'm fighting Fury, period. Whether or not he has the belt. You know, whether or not he has the belt. Uh, the thing with the title, and this is a run that, uh, a system that I want, I don't want to fall into anymore, is like, okay, when you start a run, then you're going to make concession with maybe a organization or a title organization. You have to fit into something and I would just want to be free and fight. I don't want to own uh, anything to uh, anybody or to respond to anybody, right? So uh, I don't want that political stuff like with the title and this. Obviously, if the title is on the line and no string attached, yes, of course, I'll grab it. It's good for the decoration. <laughs> I I appreciate that. You're you're changing the way people are viewing boxing, which is huge. Uh, you you are also now ranked. When you found out that the WBC was going to put you in their rankings, what was your reaction? That was cool. I mean, again, that wasn't something that I was um, looking for. I want a great fight. I want to go out there, do what I can possibly do. You know, really like beat some some boxer out. <laughs> I think that's gr- even greater than any any of those. And uh, uh, just a couple more questions, and I'll let you go. Uh, I appreciate the time, as always. You always coming on is always very appreciative. Uh, to fight another fighter of African descent, does that mean anything? You know, he represents Nigeria as well. Does that mean anything to you? Does that make it more special to you? You say what? You know, Anthony Joshua is of African descent as well. He, his family is from Nigeria, um, and he is proud of yes. his roots there. And I know there was some talk maybe of you guys fighting in Africa. I'm just meaning. I'm just wondering for you, does it mean anything more to fight another fighter of African descent? Of course. I mean, I don't. You have to understand this. So basically, we both, even though we are fighting, we both are basically step uh, on top of the game, right? Everybody is being taken care of. Everybody is showing case. One will be the winner. One will be the loser. Uh, uh, loser. But at the end of the day, we will be next to each other. Up there. Right? So at the end of the day, it's, it's a great start for both of us. He could have been my brother. I would fight him because he's elevated us both. He's elevated the sport. He's elevated the continent. You know? It's not about fight. It's not you are not fighting somebody because you don't hate him, because you don't like him, because you hate him. No, you fight him because it's a challenge. And fight always elevate both fighters, whether it's the winner or the loser, because both put a lot of work in to get there. And without a loser, there is not a winner. So we 
both we do that for each other. So of course, it's great. And I really put uh, a respect on that. I really consider that. And again, um, Eddie Hearn said a lot of shit, but one thing that I say, he said that makes sense is that for potential, maybe potential rematch in Africa mm. with, uh, with Joshua, yes. I think that that sounds cool. We will call it, we will call that black excellence. <laughs> I love it. Uh, your, your your coach Eric Nixick uh, spoke to MMA Junkie recently, and the clip went viral. Of uh, he he got emotional talking about what you paid him for the last fight. And again, not getting into specifics, but I'm just wondering. He said he had never received anything like this before. Uh, could you tell us about that? Inter- Guess what? Yeah. Me either. I never receive anything like this. <laughs> That's so right. why w- are you surprised? <laughs> no, but you know, there's some fighters who don't pay as much, and you know, the, you know, you know the fight game. There's people who don't take care of the ones around them, and, and he seemed genuinely touched um, by what he did. No, no, I know the fight game pretty pretty well to know that there is a lot of also a lot of people next to fighters that just want to take advantage on them and then want to play on their, their psychology and will be like, oh, they don't take care of me. Like, what have you done? What do you deserve? When a fighter feel like you deserve, you deserve, period. Like, nobody will be like he deserves and then have to claim. The people that deserve never even have to claim. When somebody is claiming, in fact, something wrong, he doesn't, might not really deserve. And I have seen that a lot. People trying to take advantage on the fighter and they want to make fighters look bad about that, which is wrong. So if somebody said that, tell him bullshit. Mm, okay, fair enough. Or ask, or, or ask the fighter why. Because I I truly don't believe that you somebody like deserve something and work hard for you. You know the work that you're putting in and the person is putting the same, uh, putting a effort in and you see it, you respect it and then you don't pay him. I don't, I don't see why. The, speaking of the, but, the fighters, it's one thing to do what you did with Fury, but now to do it twice and who knows what happens later on this year as well. Do you think that this will officially be the beginning of, of fighters starting to realize that they shouldn't be tied up, that they should go out and take a chance and do things like you're doing, not exactly like you're doing, but at least to now give the fighters more freedom. Do you think that this is now the official beginning of that? The official beginning of that? I don't think, I don't know. Um, but I do think that every fighter should be uh, aware of a situation. I mean, no, every fighter want to be a boxer. Don't get me wrong. No, every fighter uh, are going to have a Fury or a, a Joshua fight. Uh, no every fighter even care of becoming a boxer. Some people are just happy to be an MMA fighter and then want to stay there. Some people are just happy in the league that they are into and don't want to go anywhere. But again, my point is just that everybody should be free to do what he wants. You know, I never claim for anybody like to do things at, as I'm doing because we might not want the same thing, right? But my problem has always been the fact that I feel like force. I always, I wanted to fulfill the contract that I have signed up for. And then I feel like I was stopping to do so in my right. So that was my problem. My problem is not like MMA or boxing or whatever. Some people just want to be a kickboxer. Some people want to be an MMA fighter. Some people want to be jujitsu fighters. It's cool. As long as it's your decision. Most importantly, last question, Francis. How do you win on March 8th? How I win on March 8th? Doesn't matter. I think most likely um, knock him Anthony Joshua out. I think he's, he's easier to go to go down than uh, Fury. I mean, not like he's not a strong fighter. He's a very tough fighter. But he's easier to send down than Fury. And then... Uh, it's harder for him to get back up than Fury. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, what a time to be alive, Francis. Congratulations on doing it again. Good luck in this training camp. Thank you, thank uh, you. We can't wait for the press conference next week. We'll see you two face-to-face for the first time. What a sight. That's the battle of the bodybuilders, they say. Rumble and Riyadh. What a sight it's going to be. You and Anthony Joshua face-to-face. Uh, I can't wait for it. So thank you as always for the time. Enjoy your time out in France. And uh, good luck in training. And hopefully we'll speak to you soon again. 
Okay, thank you, Arias. Thank you to all the fans, for everyone listening. And um, see you guys. See you soon. There he is, Francis Nganou. March 8th, as he said, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. What a time to be alive. What a fight. I can't wait to see how this one uh, plays out. I, I definitely feel like there is a lot more excitement, positivity, intrigue, interest. Uh, you've got Matchroom involved. You've got uh, Queensberry is going to be involved in the card as well. This one is going... I, I actually think the first one was the first one, and the first one, um, no doubt, special. But this one does feel like it's almost as big, if not bigger. I don't know. Maybe I'm a victim of the moment. Uh, later in the program, we're going to talk to the aforementioned Eddie Hearn to get his take. You know, Eddie, what, what I love about fights like this is Eddie doesn't have to play both sides. He can fully root on his guy. That's what was fun about Taylor Serrano at MSG. Jake was backing Serrano. Eddie was backing Taylor. And it's fun sometimes to see the promoter not have to be, you know, down the middle. I like that. And just have them, you know, support their guy. Um, and, you know, you know, Eddie and, uh, Eddie and AJ... They go a long way since the Olympics in 2012. Anthony Joshua wins the uh, the gold medal and thus begins his career. And you can make and and, he, and he's been with Eddie ever since. And by the way, if you can find, I think I've talked about it on this show. If you can find the Louis Theroux hour mini doc on AJ, the sit down that just came out maybe in. I don't know, November. They spoke around the Franklin fight, which was in April, but it came out, I think, end of October, early November. It's phenomenal. It's the best version of AJ that I've ever seen. Relaxed, fun, goes back to his, you know, old stomping grounds, uh, I believe near Watford. Don't hate me if I get that wrong. Brighton, maybe? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out the whole geography of the situation. Um, yeah, I can't wait. See here. Ding, 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 ding. Is that the hold music? Yes. I like it. Um, need some water here, Frank. A lot of excitement. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be joined by Ian Machado. Gary, obviously, a lot to talk to him about. Uh, he was supposed to fight on December 15th in Las Vegas at the final UFC pay-per-view of the year, the final show of the year. He was supposed to fight Vicente Luque. He has to pull out on the Wednesday evening before the fight due to pneumonia. And on the Saturday, right after the event, it was announced that he would be fighting Jeff Neal. Remember, he was supposed to fight Jeff Neal uh, back in August. Jeff Neal forced to withdraw. Uh, he then fights Neil Magny. He beats Neil Magny on that card in Boston. Um, and now they're running it back with Jeff Neal. And some people, including myself, a little bit surprised that they didn't go with Vicente Luque again just because that was the fight and Luque didn't end up fighting. Uh, but they're going back to Jeff Neal. And, of course, Jeff Neal was on our show at the very end of the year, maybe the last show of the year or the second to last show of the year, one of those. Um, and we got his thoughts, and obviously the fight was uh, a little personal because, you know, the T-shirt and all that stuff. So I think there's a big... There's a big spotlight now on Ian Gary. A lot of people uh, waiting to see how he responds to all of this. And uh, I, I think by the end of this year, this could end up being the biggest year of his career. Just because there's so much at stake. Let me get that water. Mm -hmm. Later on the program, Bo Nichols fighting at UFC 300. Alexander Rakic, who's also fighting at UFC 300 against Yuri Prochaska. What a fun fight that is in the 205-pound division. Uh, I am really interested in that fight. And then Eddie Hearn will round things out. Back to the usual interview program. Hope you enjoyed the award show on Wednesday. For the most part, People really uh, didn't seem to dis – we really have people disagreeing here and there, but people didn't really seem to mind all that much all of our picks, which was nice. Uh, and someone who I would assume 
is planning on having a massive year and winning a whole bunch of awards come this time next year. About 2024 is our next guest. Let us get right to him. His name, Ian Machado Gary. He returns to action on February 17th in Anaheim, California, UFC 298 against Jeff Neal. He's kind enough to join us right now. There he is. Hello, Ian. How are you? How are you, sir? How are you getting on? I'm doing great. Uh, it's great to have you back on. It's great to see you in good spirits and good health. So let us start there. How are you feeling? How's your health? Obviously, last time you were in uh, in focus just a few weeks ago, you were battling a lot of stuff. So how are you feeling? Better, good. Um, yes, yeah, it's that was tough. I wasn't able to get out of bed and I wasn't able to breathe that well. I just coughing my lungs up. So I'm better. I'm starting training again. My lungs feel fine. So I'm ready to go. I'm getting back into it. How long? So you, you officially uh, withdrew, or at least the announcement came that you couldn't fight um, at uh, two ninety six on the Wednesday evening. It was late Wednesday yeah. evening. How long before mm-hmm. that were you battling that illness? So we got really, really bad a couple of days before Wednesday, and it was to the case of where I literally I hadn't gotten out of bed in three days, and then. I'd lost four and a half kilos in sleep. I, was, I wasn't I was eating. I had no appetite. I was just in bed, sleeping, shivering. And then we called the UFC and the doctor and said, look, Ian's not feeling great at all. And the rest, you know about me. How difficult was that for you? Really difficult, really upsetting. I had a little cry about it. I, had, I was upset because, firstly, I never want to pull out of a fight. It's what I love to do. It's my job, but it's also my enjoyment. It's what I love more than anything else, else in the world is go out there and show up and have fun. And the reason this one hurt so much was because of all the shit stuff that was going on behind the scenes. That was my opportunity to respond. That was my opportunity to show to the world that you can talk all the shit you want. No matter what, I'm going to show up in that octagon and I'm going to beat the living piss out of whoever's in front of me because that's my job. And I was, I didn't get that opportunity. So we'll do it in February. So, so, you know, that's what was so interesting. Like there were all these big names on this card, right? Leon and Colby and flyweight title and uh, Tony and Patty. And, and, and you can make a case that your appearance, your fight was the most talked about one because of all the stuff going on and because of where you're at in your career. And so, would you say that was the most trying time of your life and, and career? The fact that you're right there, you're in Vegas, you're dealing with all this shit, and now you have to withdraw. And every, I mean, there was there was a storm that came afterwards, right? Like everyone was piling on you. I don't know if I would say it was the most trying time. It was upsetting. It was very, very upsetting. And not and you know, hearing the fact that Dr. D was like, "There's no way you'd compete this week." Um, if it was next week or early Jan, I would still be worried about you. Um, because obviously pneumonia has long-term effects that can that can pop up. That was hard to hear because I wanted there was nothing else I wanted to do than go out there and put on a show. Ultimately, what was the diagnosis? It was pneumonia. It was flu that had developed into pneumonia, and it sucked. It hurt, but that's life. Unfortunately, you've got to take it as it comes, and now we can only move and look forward to February. We have a date, we have an opponent, and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to channel all of my energy, all of my my missed joy from that opportunity to go out and show the world Ian Michelle Gary in full flight. I'm going to just wait and I'm going to do that against Jeff in February. So just curious, right after that event, uh, Dana announced 299 Miami, which was March 9th, and then we found out he went back and, and, and later said February 17th, Anaheim. What what changed there? Why the, the change in dates? So I, I got a call after I'd been sick because the UFC wanted to quickly rearrange something to make sure that my fight was still going ahead. And they said to me, Vincente Luque in January or Jeff Neal in February. And I said, your doctor was literally here a couple of hours ago and told me that January is a bad idea, so I guess it's February. So I agreed, I told them, I came back to them, and that was February. So for me, it's, it's, that, that was it. It's like... It's one of those things is I can't <laughs> I can't wait to fight again. When I get emotional about it, still now thinking about it, because that was a real opportunity to respond. And even like to, to 
to answer your point, I've kind of lost your question because I'm thinking about fighting again. I'm thinking about that response, Ariel. Yeah. I'm thinking about going in there in California and getting that response. And yeah, it's 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 going to be a lot of shit that's going to make me very, very happy after that fight to get my hand raised. Um, so yeah, I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm just losing a bit of focus there thinking about this. But yeah, I had agreed to February, okay. not to March. I don't know where that came from. I got here that was like, what? All right, I guess it's March. And then it was later brought back to February. And and why is it Neil, who of course you you were supposed to fight in August, and not Luke, who you were supposed to fight in December? Why, why did it go back to Neil? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. That was that was I think that's the fight they wanted. That's all I can assume, but I don't know. What would you have preferred? Which scenario? I would have preferred that I fought Luke yeah. <laughs> in December and Jeff Neil in February. That's what I I would have preferred because I like to stay active. But it, it, like knowing that you didn't fight in December, would you have liked to have run it back with Luke, or do you like the idea of kind of going back to Neil and then maybe Luke down the line? The truth is, I was offered a name. I accepted that name. I got sick. They offered me another name. I accepted that name, and now I'm focused on that. There is no preferred. Jeff Neil is a higher rank. Cool, great. Luke is a lower rank. It doesn't bother me. At the end of the day, the truth is, when I show up, Ian Machado, Gary Shum, put on a show. And that's what everyone's looking looking out for. And that's what everyone's excited for. And the names I'm doing again, against is only relevant to showcase my talent of what I can do to Luke or what I can do to Jeff Neal. I'm the guy that everyone's tuning in to watch for that fight. Okay, so you you, you mentioned the, the shitstorm and all that stuff and, and being yeah. able to respond. What went wrong here? Why did this all start, Ian? Why do you think that there are so many people trying to hate on you, the videos, all this stuff? You put out an advert, right? You put out a thing directly responding to a lot of it. Why does it feel like all of a sudden in the last two months or so, all of this came your way? I feel like a lot of people are sheep and a lot of people believe some ridiculous things online and they run with it. And then a lot of a lot gets kind of Chinese whispers taken out of context. And a lot of people don't understand my personal life or anything to do with it or anything to do with me, my family, my team. They've just heard whispers and rumors. And the truth is people love to hate the internet, Instagram, Twitter, all of it is a very toxic place. And especially MMA media. 99% of it is very toxic. One minute they love you, the next minute they hate you. We've seen it. The hate is ridiculous. The love is amazing. So I think it might have all come my way because of my success and my rise and everything I'm doing and people either love it or they hate it. Either way, they're giving me content and they're tuning into my fights. How were you dealing with it? I, I saw like one day you posted like a bunch of videos in response. I thought maybe you would ignore all the noise. You you obviously kind of leaned into it, like I said, with the advert and whatnot. Um, but how behind the scenes, no one likes to read stuff. Like it's much more fun when it's positive, right? So how, how were you yeah, dealing with sure. it? It fucking stung. It stung on a level of, on a level of, I've agreed kind of not really agreed it, but I don't mind. I'm in the fight game. It's my job. It's my it's my passion. And it's part of the game. We did the fight game. You build a fight, you sell a fight, you have some fun. But when people start attacking my loved ones with vicious, vile, untrue and hurtful words to an obsessive level, it boils my blood. And it boiled my blood to an extent of which I have to be the bigger man and not respond until I have the opportunity to respond, which was at UFC 296. So I was pissed. I still am pissed. And there's a lot of people I'm pissed at. But I'll get on my back eventually. It will all come back. I will get it. And, and so that's that's a really interesting point. Like, you know, there have been polarizing figures in this sport, right? Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. none more so than... Conor McGregor, someone that you look up to, but no one speaks of his his partner, his fiance, 
your wife, Layla, has been talked about in, in, in this story as much as you, if not maybe more than you. And so how were you I mean, both dealing with that and how is she dealing with that? Uh, you're right. It's like, it's, it's tough. At first, it was, it was upsetting. It was hurtful. It was difficult. Just by the sheer amount and obsessive, like, just the, the number of which people were attacking us and just the constant, constant notifications of people talking shit and people posting videos and all of this nonsense. But now, I mean, now we're, we've, we've come out of this stronger knowing that the truth is the people that don't eat at our table, if you're not at our table and you don't eat at our table, then it's irrelevant what people say online. The people that are around me, the team I've surrounded myself, I love and adore my wife. I chose to be with her because she is the most inspirational person I've ever met. And I want her by my side till the very fucking end of my life. And that's my choice. I don't care about other people's opinions about what I do in my life. That's my decision. And I think that we're even having a conversation about some people talking about who I should and shouldn't be with is absolutely ridiculous. Keep your opinions to yourself and let me be me and you do you. So me and Layla are, are better off from it now, but absolutely we were hurt at the start. But we're very grateful to be in the position that we can grow from something so toxic. At any point in the last few months, did it feel like it was affecting your relationship? I mean, absolutely. How could it not when people like... My wife was called a pedophile, a sexual predator. I, I, that's horrible to hear. That's horrible to say about someone's wife. The person that someone chose to marry and have a child with. There's people out there saying, like, like my son isn't mine. It's somebody else's. Of course, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for us because it's a lot of hurt. It's a lot of hate. And people react differently to that hate. I'm someone who will kind of forget all about it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't care about it. But then Layla's like, no, we need to talk about this. We need to talk through it because talking through it will ena eventually enable us to be able to get over it better together. And that's what we ended up doing. We ended up sitting down and talking about it and understanding why I was upset and why she was hurt and, and dealing with it. And that's why we have been able to come out of this song. So, you know, over the, over the past two years or so since you entered the UFC, I've heard you say to me and others, like, you you want to be a disruptor, right? Uh, you did that 100%. in Boston. Uh, even in July, mm -hmm. like, you, you, were, you were a hot topic because you wore the T-shirt with mm -hmm. the mugshot and whatnot. Yeah. Was there any part of you that came to the realization, like, hey, if I'm going to be a disruptor, I'm going to have to deal with what comes with that? No. Because... Because my job is selling off. My, my job is promoting my fight to the best level I can, to show up and have the most fun fight that I can. I'm not viciously assaulting and attacking people's families in any way, shape, or form to the way that the MMA world is going at a very toxic level. I mean, the, the best example is... He's an absolute piece of shit for doing this, but it's a perfect example. You've got someone like Colby Covington, who isn't trash talking, he's desperate. To the point at which he mentioned a, 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 a person's, his father's murder, his fellow fight. He used that sore point in someone's life to try to stay relevant, to try win a mental battle. That's, that's the point in, in MMA where we're at. And then we've got people like Sean Strickland who were talking all that mad stuff online, attacking people's families and people's wives. And the truth is, he is just someone who is dealing with his childhood trauma, the hurt and the pain from his past, and projecting it to the world. I am not that. I am selling a fight and having fun in my life. And that's it. I'm a disruptor. I'm a disruptor just like Jake Paul and Logan Paul and Conor McGregor and all of the best, biggest stars in the world are disruptors. But it's a fine line. Hmm. So uh, Sean Strickland obviously put a lot of oxygen into all of this uh, in his videos. Uh, he he uh -huh. mentioned, and I want to ask you about the video that came out of him recently with Theo Vaughn, but, but 
when all this was going on, he mentioned seeing you at the PI. Could you tell me your, your side of that story? It was, I wouldn't say it was a seeing, it was more of a, a glance and him being shuffled into an ele- into a lift. And that was it. And he had a little snigger on his face. I shouted something at him. I don't know what I shouted at him, but I shouted something at him before I even had a chance to think. Um, my body went straight into fight mode and then the doors closed. That was it. There was, there was nothing much to it, to be honest. What do you think would have happened if you guys would have walked past each other? I, I would have fucking talked to him for sure. I would have, I would have, I, I, I don't know. See, this is the thing. I'm not going to start throwing hands with the bloke because I'm, I'm a, I'm a better person than that. And I would like to be above all this, all the shit that was said and just sit there and be like, I'm, I feel sorry for you, man. I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry that all this shit has you that hurt that you're attacking everybody else. I feel like that's what I'd like to say. Whether I would have said that or not, I don't know. <laughs> so then, uh, very recently, this interview comes out with him and Theo Vaughn, and he gets very emotional, and uh, he starts talking about some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. very hard to listen to uh, any child going through that. When you hear that, and then when you hear him talk about what Drickus said about him and how there's a line and that you don't talk about families, and and then, of course, what he said about your family, what is your reaction? So, and I, I obviously responded to that point online already. When I seen that post, I responded with a message. And this is my point that I'd like to kind of get across. I don't... I don't personally care what happened in his childhood or what happened in his past that has him the way he is now. I don't care what happened in your past. Don't attack and project your pain onto other people or to other people's families because you can't deal with it correctly. The UFCPI has mental health um, as, as, as ways to deal with our athletes' mental health. Go talk to them and deal with it in the way that it should be dealt with. Talk about it. Get rid of it. Release it. Express it. Because to attack other people's families and other people's loved ones because you have trauma, childhood trauma, is completely unfair. It's, it's, it's inexcusable. You don't have a reason to attack other people because you are in pain. That's kind of my outlook on it. And that's where I kind of sit there and, you know, when, when I sit and talk to my team, like, that is kind of where I feel sorry for them. But equally, at the same point, I'm like, I don't give a fuck what happened in your childhood. Don't speak in that manner about anybody else on the planet. Deal with your issues first. And if I was someone who is throwing stones in the glass house vibes, protect your house first before you start throwing at other people. So I, I, I saw your video of your kind of like uh, your hit list for the upcoming year. Um, <laughs> is, is it accurate to say Jeff Neal, Colby, and Sean? Is that the order in a perfect world for you? There is, there is a, 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 yes, yes. There is a very specific reason I would like those people. It's, Jeff is a very, a very good body for me to go off and showcase to the world just how elite I am and how good I am at what I do. Kobe has also talked a lot of shit about me. He's talked about me. He's mentioned my wife. He also he obviously lost the fight against Kobe. Kobe is someone who wants those big fights, someone who's going to chat shit, someone who's going to entertain the fans, someone who's going to bring a lot of hype to the event. I am going to box the ears off Kobe because of the stuff he said. And there isn't going to be anybody in that world or in this octagon who's going to be able to save, save him. I promise you now, I'll, I'll finish him. And I'll do it in three rounds. I don't need five rounds to finish him. I'll do it in two. I'll do it in one. Kobe Covington is going to be slapped. And I hope I hit him so hard that he's never able to speak again. And I feel like a lot of people on this planet would be very happy that he never gets to speak on a mic again. So that's what I'd like with Kobe. And whether it's this year or whether it's next year, I'd love Sean Strickland because any man or any person who ever talks or mentions me, my wife, and my family in that way, I'm going to get my hands on. And in an ideal world, towards the end of the year, I don't think Sean Strickland's going to be the world champion anymore. 
And I believe there's absolutely an opportunity for me to step up to middleweight and give him a hiding. And maybe, maybe I'll beat him so bad that he'll forget all that trauma from his childhood and he can thank me. And so where does uh, currently the champion at 170 is Leon Edwards? And, and obviously there was some drama yeah. with him and his team. Where does, where does he factor into all of this? I think this year, I think this year Leon will probably fight twice. I don't believe I'll get a title shot towards the end of the year. I have work to be done right now. And I see, I think there's guys above me still. I think there's Bilal who should be next. And then there's someone like Shadkat knocking on the door. How can he not be... How can they not be the next two contenders that deserve a shot at the title? So it's from a point of view of if I don't get a, a Kobe, if I, do, I, I believe I'll get Kobe, if I don't get a Sean Strickland vibe, I wouldn't mind taking out Kamara Usman as well. I wouldn't mind taking out two of the baddest men on the planet for in this division for so long and then earning my, earning my title shot for next year. Um, you know, because of the, uh, the illness that you were battling on fight week, we, we didn't see much of you that week. Uh, Leon had to answer a lot about you and the story that went on at Renegade. Can I ask your side of the story? It's very simple. It's very simple. I had a very good connection with that gym. And I went up one day and I was politely asked to not return. Um, I then was driving up that day anyway because I had booked sessions in. I had booked people to, to, to spend time with people and do some do some work. And I went to Renegade to talk to Leon and I was stopped by Ash, one of the owners of the gym and Leon's head coach. And we sat outside and we had a conversation about it. And what I took away from that conversation was, and I've repeated this very, very clearly, that Leon and his head, his head coach didn't want me training on the match with Leon. Didn't want Leon having any doubts or insecurities about the team or about the mats because there's a threat on the mats. Now, Ariel, if you're Leon's head coach and you say that to me in person and you give me a genuine reason, you're not going to turn around to Leon as, as Dave is not going to turn around to Leon and go, oh, I told him you were a threat, but he was, he was a threat to you, by the way, and that, that I didn't want him on the map because I didn't want you to get anxious or insecure. He's not going to turn around and say that. No good head coach would say that to their fighter. It would only piss their fighter off. But they were the words that were said to me. And that upset me because I like the guys in that gym. I, I still to this day think I get along with them all because I never had any bad blood with any of them. So that upset me because I thought I had I thought I had a little friendship with the people up there to a certain extent. Um, and then yeah, it's little things of like if if it was something to do with Renegade, there's a separate striking coach, Leon's striking coach, Henry Clemson who I was very fond of and I liked to work with. I pulled him out to Brazil to get ready for the Jeff Neal fight that ended up being the Neil Magny fight. If it was to do with Renegade, then why couldn't I train with him? Because Leon and his head coach didn't want me training with anybody Leon trained with because the doubts and insecurities. And that's it. And that's simply my side of the story from what I was told by them. So, so where is your home now? Is it Brazil? Is that where you're going to be training from, from here on forward? I love shoot the box. I love shoot the box. I love Brazil. I love, I love the energy that Brazil possesses. There's just something special in the, in the people, in the soil, in the food that they eat. There's an amazing energy. So for right now, absolutely, Brazil is my home. Of Diego Lima is a phenomenal, phenomenal man. He's an amazing human being. And what he's doing at Shoot the Box is absolutely sensational. And I'm very proud to represent and be a part of the Shoot the Box family. And he's opened his doors to me and my family. And in tough times, they were there for us. They showed us love. They said, if there's any shit on fight week, we'll travel every single person out of <laughs> Vegas and we'll all be there for you. He said, we'll sleep on the floor. There's another, uh, the general of the team, Cicero. He's, he pulled my wife aside one day and he said, Layla, we've seen all this shit online. We want you to know that we love you guys here. We love you that you bring your family here. We're a part of your team. If you need help, we're all here for you. And that's the type of people that I want to be surrounded by. That's why Brazil is my home right now. Yes. Are, are you hopeful that this could be your home, like that there'll be no more moving around? I feel like no matter what, Ariel, I, I want to move around and learn because I'm still not... I don't want to... 
what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to reduce the opportunity to be able to travel the world and learn from such, such amazing people. I might travel a bit less, but I still feel like to be the most elite athlete on the planet, you need to learn from other elite athletes. And I feel like that's what I'll always try and end up doing because I have a lot of friends in this game. I have a lot of people that I, I will enjoy learning from. So I don't think the travel will ever stop. It, it seemed like you had a great thing in Florida. What, why, why did yeah, you move on from there? So I knew, I, for this fight, like, obviously I was free with Vincente Luca. Right. I took a step back from Kilton because I gave him the respect that you've been here, you've got your family, you've just got a house here, let me go. I've already been issued the box in Brazil prior for my last camp. Let me take a step back. Um, and I found a lot of people there that cared about me in, in Brazil and in shoot the box. And I've seen it with their energy with Charles Oliveira. I've seen the way they're, they're a family. They're, they're one. They're connected. They all care. And I feel like that's so important to me right now in my career that I want people who care. I want people who want to see me do well. And that's the reason I'm going back to Brazil is there's an energy there that's just so special. So this camp will be uh, for this 298 fight will be in Brazil? Yes, we fly back to Brazil the end of this week, and we'll be there for a month, and then we'll head out to Florida from there, or to California from there. And and one last one, if I may, when all this was going on, uh, Neil Magny spoke up about some of the issues that he had following the comments that you made about mm -hmm. him. Do you have any regrets about those comments? I did not make any comments about Neil Magny. Neil Magny made comments about himself. I just called him up on it. As someone with strong morals, I call them up on what he said, his wording. That's it. Nobody else did on that day. So I felt it was my job to call them up on it. Okay, so then to take it a step further, in the last six or seven months, do you wish you did any moves differently? In other words, do you wish you, you know, zigged when you zagged? Do you, do you, do you have any regrets that maybe would have avoided any of this, you know, shitstorm in the aftermath? Anything you wish you could have done differently? No, I believe that problems and shit storms are a part of life at times. Obviously, it hurts and it's terrible and bad things can come from it. You know, it's like the truth is people don't know the extent of which their words can hurt people and the damages that can come from that. So I would just say to the people that I'll hate, think about it next time because it hurts and think about when you've been hurt. It's not a nice thing to go through. But to answer your point, I think everything happens for a reason. And I know that sounds so horrible to say, like the shit that we went through happened for a reason. But I feel like me and my wife are stronger together because we've gone through such toxic pain and verbal vicious assault that we've come closer together and found that we are the better team when we're together, that we, we need to talk and be there for each each other because I love her very much and none of the stuff that was said about her was true and I think that is the most hurtful for me so when I think about all the shit and to mention the Neil Magny thing would I ever go back and change that someone said that they have been accustomed to giving that type of ass whooping to their child on a public platform. No, I would never change that. I have strong morals and I would never be able to raise my hand to my child. And whether people like to think of spun or not, they were the words that came out of that man's mouth. And I only pulled them up on it. Would I have changed the Jeff Nealty? Fuck no, no, it was hilarious. It was fun. I had a good laugh with it. You know what I mean? That's the thing. It's for selling. No one knows who Jeff Neal is. No one knows it. I, I run into people on the street. Oh, when's your next fight? Cool. Who's it against? Oh, I've never heard of him. They don't know who he is. He's irrelevant. So I would not have changed anything that happened in the past because everything happens for a reason. And all of this, all of this is a minor, tiny scale of hate, of hurt, of vicious assaulting compared to what it's going to be when I'm the world champion in a couple of years, Aaron. At some point, do you want to be loved? Like, are you hoping that the fans come around and, and you know, I remember when we first, when we first yeah. were introduced to you, it was you and your grandfather, right? I mean, how, how could you not fall in love with yeah. that guy? 
And, and, yeah. and so is there a point in your, in your mind when you're thinking like at some point you want them back on your side or do you just want to be the bad guy? I have no intention to be the bad guy. I have an intention to have fun. I have an intention to, to show up and enjoy my life. And whatever way I decide to do that is my way. But whether people love me or hate me, I'm going to do what I love. I'm going to show up and fight for the UFC and be a world champion because that's what I want to do. That's my dreams, my hopes, my aspirations. Whether they love me or hate me, I'm going to reach my goals. Obviously, it would be a much nicer life if everybody loved you. But with the way the world is going and this social media becoming more accessible for people to talk shit about people, I don't know how that is. I've, I've recently turned my comments off because for me, on Instagram, I think and sit there and say, I can protect this piece online for all the people that do love me and come to my social media to see what I'm doing, where I am, and the adventures and the freedom I'm on and who I'm training with, I want them to see that and be excited. Not go to the comment section, go, I'm excited for your next fight, and then see people give a wave of hate. So I've turned them off. I can protect that piece. And it's the same with fighting. If you want to show up and boo at me, or you want to show up and cheer for me, either way, I'm going to go out and do my job and have some. Last question. So, is, is, is Dublin still on the radar for this year? I, you know, Aaron, I've, I hope so. I really, really hope so. I'm going to push for it like I always do. Um, I know Dana said Dublin in a in a, a a video recently, and then said he was talking about a boxing event. So I don't know what the UFC's plans are, but I believe that if the timeline will work correctly, and I fight Jeff Neal in February, and I I knock him unconscious, and then Conor McGregor is back supposedly, as according to himself. June 29th against Michael Chandler. Well, I would absolutely love the opportunity to fight Kobe Covington on the card. I think that would be a very powerful card for me to make a statement against Kobe and bury him and put him into the dirt face down. I don't see after that fight why I couldn't try get them back to Ireland, why I couldn't try shout for that. I'll do my very best and I'll keep trying until it happens. All the best to you, Ian. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, good luck in training, safe travels to Brazil. Happy to hear that you are healthy and uh, in good spirits and can't wait for your return on February 17th. I appreciate it. Thank you. The response is going to be insane. Can't wait. Thank you, Ian. All the best to you guys. <laughs> there he is, Ian Machado Gary. Uh, tremendous stuff, fascinating stuff from uh, you know one of the biggest names in the game right now and uh, certainly someone who is hoping to make a statement in his next fight. That's February 17th. Our next guest is hoping to make a big statement. God, I'm looking forward to seeing him back. It feels like it's been far too long. Last time we saw him was in July. He's uh, one of the fighters who will be competing at UFC 300. Like I said at the top of the show, that card slowly taking shape. And one of the first fights that we found out was uh, official for the UFC 300 card on April 13th in Las Vegas was Cody Brundage versus our next guest, Bo Nickel, one of the rising stars in the sport, undefeated, the pride of Penn State. There he is. And I'm so happy that the hair is back, by the way. The hair, we're going back to the uh, the longer hair, yes? For, for a second, um, but come fight time, all business. I'm, I'm just trying to look like you, you know? Beard, <laughs> shaved head, I like, keep it fresh. I, I like the long hair, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, most importantly, Bo, congratulations to you and, and your wife on uh, the birth recently. How is fatherhood? How, how would you describe it? It's always interesting to talk to a uh, first-time dad right out of the gate. How's it going so far? It's been amazing, you know. I think that um, you really don't really know, I guess, that type of love until you have a, have a kid. And, um, you know, my son's two weeks old now. And, uh, I, the last two weeks have been the best two weeks of my life. So I'm so grateful that my wife was able to, uh, have a smooth pregnancy and everything with the labor and delivery went well and got a healthy baby. And, uh, he's awesome. So I'm just super grateful and, you know, even more motivated to go out there and, uh, compete and do my thing and be a good example for him. Well, that is great to hear. Um, could I ask, as I said, man, it's, it feels like it's been too long and we're going to have to wait three or so more months, right? Why haven't you fought since July? There's a lot of reasons. You know, I think that um, one being that this was the longest break I've taken since I was five years old. And by break, I mean, I took a month off of training in September. And, uh, 
wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't training and I was just, you know, recovering and going hunting and doing, pursuing some other passions that I was interested in. So, so um, that month was the longest that I've taken off since, you know, being five years old. And uh, I think my body needed it. And then, you know, just with my mind and my development, um, looking to just continue to improve, develop, get better in the sport. And you can definitely do that fighting and competing, but I feel like I had fought five times, um, in the last basically 365 days from July to July. And so I felt like it was my time to, you know, get a little rest recovery and then just train and develop and improve. Did they come to you with some ideas or did they know that you were going to take some time off and kind of left you alone? I just told them that I wanted to take some time and that, uh, I would reach out when I'm ready to go. So, um, towards the end of the year, uh, in December, I just told them, Hey man, let's go UFC 300, get me on there. And they, the UFC was all about it. Um, I think of course it, you know, made sense for me and they were very you know, easy to work with and, um, yeah, made it happen. And, and so how did we land on Cody Brundage? That was just, you know, they, they gave me a couple names and, um, he was a guy I thought uh, posed a you know a little bit different challenge for me, having a wrestling background, having you know pretty solid knockout power, having you know a couple wins um, as of lately. So you know he was the name that we picked, and uh, you know I'm excited for the fight. I think that you know he's a tough opponent. He's definitely um, had ups and downs in the UFC, but you know coming off back to back wins, and you know I'm looking to continue to improve and get better. And I think that you know this is just another. Uh, challenge for me, another step for me on um, on my way to get to the top. Uh, obviously, I would say he's a, a big step up in terms of talent uh, as far as who you fought in the UFC, but I'm wondering if there was any part of you that wanted, just knowing the competitor that you are, wanted an even bigger step up, a bigger name, a bigger threat, if you will. Right. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely crossed my mind, and I feel like um, at the end of the day, I'm just not in a rush. You know, I think that I'm five fights into my professional career. And, uh, of course that's like the story with me. If everybody wants to see me fight top five, everybody wants to see me fight the champion. Everybody wants to see me fight the best of the best. And we'll, we'll get there in due time. You know, I'm 27, I'm five and oh, and, and, uh, you know, I, I think that what I focus on is development and improvement and getting better and better and better. You know, the, the winning is a great part of the sport and it's, you know, a, a big part of the goal. But for me, the main thing I want to focus on is just getting better, improving, and uh, I think this fight is, is part of that process. And, you know, the big fights will come. So I'm not in a rush. By the time you do fight, it will be, you know, nine months since your last fight. Any concern about ring rust? No, not at all. For me, um, I'm on competition mode all the time. So, you know, I, I think that I treat every day like uh, every day is a world championship for me. So, you know, uh, ring rust, I think maybe is more of a factor in guys that, take some time off, they sit around, they party, they gain weight, that type of thing. But I'm always training, always improving, always competing. And when I get time off and uh, time to train and do that stuff, I think I'm going to come out even better and even more motivated. So, you know, this is definitely going to be the best performance that I've had in my professional career. And I'm not worried about the ring rust at all. Uh, do you know uh, what spot on the card you'll be fighting on? I don't. So there was like a tweet going around there saying Bo Nickel is going to open up the the fight or the whole card, like very first fight on the prelims. And uh, I was like, that's news to me. You know, I, I think the, somebody just made that up uh, as as people do. So um, I, I, I don't know. We'll see where the UFC puts me. I would assume that uh, given my last two uh, fights being uh, on the pay-per-view that I'll be on the pay-per-view again. But if they want to put me on the prelims, that's fine, too, you know. No matter what, I'm going to go out there and perform. Um, I know this is a big card, definitely a little different situation than the last two cards, but uh, I feel like the UFC, that's on the UFC. It's not my job to decide where I'm at. And I'm going to go out there and smash this dude regardless. The, the reason I asked is because one time you kind of got mad at me when I asked if you were on the prelims. You remember? And you're like, come on, man. So now I'm wondering what happens if they say. I know. Well, <laughs> this is, I, 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 uh, I felt like, you know, thinking about that more, um, there's a couple different ways to go about it one you know the, actually the a lot of times the the prelims on espn get get more views there's more people watching that than the actual pay-per-view which is fine and but i i think that it's just not my job you know i, I can worry about that and uh, get pressed about where i'm at on the card or i can just go fight and do my thing so i feel like that was a little bit of growing up and maturing for me is i don't really care i'm, I'm there to fight and uh I, that's ufc's job and 
I feel like I'm a big star already, you know, with a couple fights. There's a lot of people that want to see me fight, so they'll put me where they feel is best, and it's not really my job to decide that. I'm just going to go out there and fight and uh, do, do my thing. Ultimately, you get paid the same. It doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, it doesn't. You know, and I think that, like I said, you know, there's a lot of eyes on the, those prelim fights. I think I, I saw some um, numbers on uh, ESPN viewership and stuff, and a lot of the, the prelim fights are very heavily viewed, you know, as far as not even just in the UFC, as far as all sports go. So, you know, there's going to be eyes on me no matter what. But I think that the UFC, if I were to guess, I would guess they put me on the main card just because they, they want that those that those numbers. They want to draw. They, people want to see me fight. So they're, they're going to do what's best for business. In a perfect world, how many times do you want to fight this year? If we're talking perfect world, I would like to fight, you know, four times. Um, wow. But I think more than likely I'll plan on three. You know, I want to get in there in April. I would like to get in there again, you know, hopefully International Fight Week or maybe later in July, August. And then if I can get in two more times by the end of the year, that would be great. Um, but, you know, you, you never know how it's going to go. I just plan it one step at a time and take care of what I can take care of. And that's what I've learned about MMA is it's very volatile, very unpredictable. My last fight, the guy pulled out five days notice, so six, five or six days notice. So, you know, for me, I'm just taking it one fight at a time. And I want to fight as much as I can this year. I feel like I'm rested and I'm just very eager and motivated. So I want to get in there as much as possible. Where do you think you're at January of 2025? I mean, I think I'm at least knocking on the door for the belt or the top five. Like, you know, I, I don't think it's going to take too many more fights before I'm fighting the best guys in the world. So, you know, I think I see this fight as, you know, a big part of, um, that process and you know it's my a, a little bit of a layoff and then I'm coming back and then I'd like to fight you know can, a better guy in the summer a better guy in the fall and then by the time you know November December hits fight hope maybe it, we'll see if it's a if it's a ranked guy or a top 10 guy that that would be you know ideal in my mind the one that everyone always talks about is you and Hamza that it feels like it's the biggest fight down the line that could happen at 185 did you watch his last fight against Kamar Usman and if so what do you think of his performance yeah, I was able to watch the fight. I felt like, you know, it was an interesting matchup given that they're both 170 pounders fighting 85. You know, that's always, you know, that you, there's always uh, some volatility, some unknowns there when guys are up weight. And uh, I felt like first round, he looked lights out. He looked like he always looks, you know, got him, got uh, Usman on the ground, held him down, beat him up, um, was close to the finish a couple times. And then, you know, kind of slowed, the pace slowed for both of them as the round went, or the, the rounds went on. And, I would have liked to have seen that being been a five round fight. I think that obviously Usman on short notice felt like three rounds was a better option for him, but it looked like he was the fresher guy at the end of the fight. So I think there's a lot to take from that on, on uh, both ends, you know, positively and negatively positively. He's got great grappling. You know, he's likes to overwhelm guys. He definitely, you know, very strong, um, very aggressive. And then, you know, also saw a few holes and a few areas where, Usman kind of took advantage of him. So I think there's, you know, for me, every fight that I get to watch from my opponents and guys that I might fight in the future is a big learning experience. And I just try to download all that info and take it into my training. And so I can, I can be ready when the time comes. Do you beat that version of him? I believe so. You know, I think that he's a, he's a tough guy. Of course. Um, I think when you have a guy like tomorrow, Usman, who's, one of the all-time greats at his weight class, his champion, defended the belt multiple times, um, re good wrestling base, and he's able to take him down and control him like that way he did in the first round. I think that uh, there's a lot to be said for that, but at the same time, I believe in myself, and I think that my skills uh, match up very well against him, and I feel like that's a fight uh, that I win. And and just curious, you know, the, the middleweight title is about to be defended in a couple of weeks. What is your take on the, the division right now? Because it does seem like there is a path for you where it seems like most of the guys at the very top, uh, their weakness is your best skill, right? Like it just it just feels like there's that that lane open for you right now, even with the top dogs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that my wrestling ability is absolute huge X factor. Every single guy has to prepare for me so differently than they would any other fighter. And uh, with that being said, I'm getting better and better every day. A lot of these guys are older you know they're very deep into their career whereas i'm just starting i'm still improving getting better and so you know, there's absolutely a clear path for me to the to the belt and uh that's something for me that is on my mind every day it's a huge motivator for me my goal is to be ufc champion pound for pound number one fighter in the world and so 
you know, I'm not really planning right now for beating Cody Brundage. Of course, that's part of the training, but my main plan is to get that belt, defend my, my belt 10 times. So that, that's what I'm looking, looking to do. And, uh, I see, like you said, you know, you see the path, I see the path. I think everybody sees it. That's why there's as much hype as there is on me. Uh, have you heard from a lot of your, uh, wrestling brothers given your success in the UFC guys who maybe were on the fence about making the transition to MMA and, and, and given what you've done, have you heard from people who have now, you know, kind of opened their eyes and, and mind to taking a similar path as yours, you know, the creme de la creme, the top guys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, there's multiple guys on the Penn state team right now um, that I talk with all the time who they're, you know, still in college, still finishing out their collegiate career, but once they're done, they're ready to fight. So, um, you know, I think that it's hard to, you know, you don't want to push anybody into a fight, but with that being said, there are a lot of guys that have approached me and, you know, they've been telling me that they're, they're going to make the jump once uh, the time comes. By the way, are you at the Penn state uh, gym right now? I am. Yeah. I'm in the, in the weight room right now, wrestling wow. rooms right over there. But, uh, yeah, I was just getting a workout in. So, okay. No, it's, it is, and is this where the ATT Penn state, uh, like the, the, the one that you kind of head up is that, is, is it there as well? So I'm on campus on Penn state right now. So the wrestling room and the facilities are all on campus okay. and, uh, my gym's about 10, 15 minutes away. So just a quick drive, uh, right down the road. And you're allowed to use the, the Penn state facilities, even though you're not a student there anymore. So I train with the wrestling team. So I was just doing the collegiate wrestling practice. So oh, wow. um, that's part of my training is in the morning, I do my MMA training at ATT. And then the afternoon, I come over to Penn State. I wrestle with the college guys, wrestle with, you know, some of the freestyle guys who are pursuing World and Olympic Championships. So that's, uh, you know, people a lot of times talk about, oh, don't forget your wrestling. I'm not forgetting it. I'm, I'm here every day getting that work in. Are you training as like one of the boys or are you coaching them as well? It's a little of both, you know. I think that my role is a little different now that I'm not, you know, competing in wrestling. I'm definitely trying to help guys, and I've always kind of had that role of part athlete, part coach, where I try to, you know, be just a good leader and be able to help everybody on the team. So, you know, now it's I guess a little more swayed that way, where I'm working with guys, but at the same time, you know, I'm getting hard rounds in and and you know, going hard and trying to improve my wrestling myself. Was there any part of you that considered trying out for the Olympic team? Uh, no, you know, the coaches, the, the Olympic coaches and our wrestling coach at Penn state, they asked me kind of, they're like, come on, like, let's go. You can do it. And, uh, for me, you know, I love wrestling and I always will love wrestling, but my heart's with fighting and I don't really want to, I feel like, could I do it? Yes. But it's just, I'm more passionate about fighting and the Olympic wrestling is fun, but it's nothing like what, uh, fighting in the UFC is, you know, being able to fight in the octagon in Vegas. You know, the only thing that could come close to that is collegiate wrestling. And so, you know, the atmosphere in the in the Olympics and the World Championship, it's not really like that. And I, I just love the atmosphere. So for me, uh, I'm it's never, it, you know, people have brought it up to me. Like I said, the coaches ask me, but it's not really where my heart's at. And, and going back to the schedule real quick before I let you go, uh, if, if 300 wasn't on April 13th, let's say it was yeah. earlier or there just wasn't a 300, we're in the midst of a year where it's just random numbers. Do you think you would have come back sooner? Is the reason why this is announced and you're waiting three months because they want to showcase you on this big card. Yeah, a little bit, you know, I probably would have come back February, March, um, had this card not been available, but you know, this is going to be one that's going to go down. It's going to be legendary card. So of course I want to be a part of it. And, you know, obviously the UFC wants me to be a part of it too. When I, a lot of people are asking me on the card, I told my manager, I told Malky, you know, get me on 300 immediately. They said it's done. So they obviously want me on the card. How do you win? however I want, you know, I think that going out there for me, it's not so much focusing on how I win. It's just being in good position, um, being, uh, you know, able to dominate every second of the fight, control the clock, um, control every position that we're in and the, the finish will come. I don't believe that he's going to be able to get out of the first round with me. If he does get out of the first round, no worries. I'm going to finish him in the second. If he gets out of the second, no worries. I'll smash him in the third, but I have no doubt that this guy's not going to be able to go a full 15 minutes with me. So, for me, this is just, again, it's all about development, improvement, getting better, and uh, the finish will come. I'm not really worried about it. Can't wait. Can't wait to see you back, man. Really, we missed you. Um, welcome back. Congrats again on the baby. Thanks for uh, thanks for the time. I know we only have a couple more of these before you become a superstar, and don't return my text, so thank you for the time. I appreciate it. I know. Yeah, thanks, Ari. I appreciate you. All right, there he is, Bo Nickel, returning to action on April 13th. UFC 300 uh, coming up. 
in about 20 minutes' time, Alexander Rakic, another member of that 300 card. And, of course, Eddie Hearn will round us out as far as interviews are concerned to talk about the Anthony Joshua, Francis Ngannou fight we heard from Francis earlier in the day. Let's stick with this 300 talk. And if I could bring in the boys, we haven't heard from the boys yet. Uh, still buzzing back there over the uh, the Big Bills win over the dastardly Miami Dolphins, I presume. Maybe they've come back down to earth like Frank, who didn't quite give me the energy that I was looking for when I was trying to vibe. Are they That's there? That's too bad. Yeah, the guys? Oh, there they are. Hey, gents, right how are you? Oh, yeah, still buzzing. Still buzzing. Yeah, boom. I love it. I love it. Oh, I did. I love it. Shout out to the Bills. Shout out. As, as, uh, as the great Frank <laughs> likes to say. Um, all right, so 300 coming into focus a little bit more. Um, I want to ask you guys about the two fights announced last night uh, by Dana White. So 299, yeah. DP versus BSD. Let's let's put that one on ice for a second because I want to keep the 300 uh, talk going. Oliveira Sarukian. Interesting on a couple levels. Charles Oliveira was supposed to fight for the belt. He gets injured. 10 or so days before that fight in Abu Dhabi, in walks Volkanovsky, he loses. We presume, and he presumed, right? He was on the show about a week later, and he said that he suspects he's next. Well, his next fight isn't against them. It's against the supremely tough Armin Sarukin, who may I remind you both, you may not know this, but on our 2024 mega preview show over on The Ringer, I predicted Armin Sarukin would be the 2024 fighter of the year, and I also predicted he'd be the lightweight champion by the end of the year. I'm not sure if I thought it would happen this fast. Like, he beats Oliveira. You can make the case that he is next for Islam, especially if he does it in emphatic faction. Uh, faction. Rick, your your reaction to this being on 300, A, and, and Oliveira taking this fight as opposed to maybe digging his heels in and saying, nah, I'm waiting for Islam because that was the fight I was supposed to have in October. So one thing just to add, Dana White tweeted that this is a number one contender fight. Now, we've seen you know, contender fights come and go and people sure. not get those shots. But I think I don't think there's much um, ambiguity. If he wins this fight, he is going to fight Islam. Like, I, th- I think they will definitely make that fight. And I think the same goes for Charles, honestly. If Charles wins this fight, um, I think they'd be inclined because they've already booked this um, again once before. So is it possible the ambiguity, by the way, is whether this is Islam's next fight, yes, right? Yes, that I think... The is, winner could Is he going to fight Gaethje right, at some exactly, point? Like, exactly. That I think is the ambiguous part, but I do think this is a number one contendership. Uh, Dana White said it, and I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be. As far as the matchup itself, I love the fight on both fronts because I think Charles can't like really dig his heels in too much. Um, he has the win over Benil Dariush, uh, an impressive win, but you know, Justin Gaethje's hanging out there. Armin is hanging out there. This clarifies a lot, right? This this clears up a lot of, of what's going on, and I think it makes Charles Oliveira have a very, 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 very strong case to fight Islam again. Like, I think this is what you need to be able to fight Islam again. So I think this fight makes a lot of sense at a lot of levels, and I think for Charles, this is a perfect fight um, to get him into that conversation and establish himself and say, like, I have to be next. Did he need to do um, it, though? I think so. I, again, like it'd be very easy to just pass him up and go with Gaethje. It'd be very easy, honestly, to even go with Armin, right? There's, there's, he has this rematch for Armin is even further in the past. Um, Charles Oliveira just fought him two fights ago, so I think that there's something that can be solidified here for Charles. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I have to imagine also, just based on the fact that he's taking it and accepting it, they probably told him, "Hey, you're not going to just be able to sit out and wait. So make some money." Establish yourself as a rightful, stamped number one contender, and uh, let's see what happens. And and I think it's for Armin. This is great. Like oh, it's amazing. if it wasn't next, one more, and what better, you know, name to have on your resume than Charles Oliveira? If that's the next one, and then you get Islam. So brilliant fight. Like you know, so, some of these fights make themselves. This one feels like a no brainer. Your thoughts, GC? So I was actually just watching back real quick. Uh, the video that Dana dropped announcing it, he actually said in the video that the winner will fight Islam when he comes back in the summer. Obviously, you know, things can change over the course of time, but he says that the winner of this will be next okay. uh, for Islam when he does return. So that's that's an interesting note. Uh, I mean, it's an incredible fight. How can you not be excited for this one? I mean, Charles is a superstar. Every time he fights, it's incredibly exciting. And Sarukian is, is an up-and-comer, and now if he wins, both these guys actually we'll get a chance at a rematch with, with Islam Makachev. I can't wait for it. Is there any part of you guys that is surprised that 
the powers that be didn't push for or the players involved, DP Oliveira and Sarukian BST, if only, I don't agree with it, but it just feels like a lot of guys, a lot of the veterans aren't so willing to fight the younger guys. And here you had two in the same video, the same announcement where it's like the stalwart, the, the, the mainstays, right? Fighting the boogeyman that like the two guys that everyone at 155 are saying, don't fight these guys, right? This is how divisions get turnover. Yeah. This is how divisions change. And it's about time. Honestly, I think this had to be done. It, it's just too much. You can sit there and wait and, and we can get some great fights because don't get me wrong. Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier. I'll watch it anytime you put it on. It'd be amazing. And, and I'm up for it. But we see it. I like the it. freshness. Yeah, yeah we've I like seen the it. Oh, I love it too. And and also, again, those guys could go round robin forever, right? You can throw Gaethje in that mix. Now, yeah. all of a sudden, those guys are fight, fighting each other forever. We need the fresh blood. BSD, Armin, these these are the fights that need to be made. And credit to the to the veterans for stepping into that position and, and taking those fights. Which one do you like better, GC? The uh, the five-round co-main DP versus BST, which is just like an insane fight. I mean, it's just like, I, I just don't know how that fight is not... I actually don't know how either of these fights is, is not incredible because, I mean, Poirier is, is ready to go to war anytime, and we've seen what BSD has done in, in his first few UFC fights every time. It's, it's just fireworks. But anytime Charles Oliveira steps into the octagon, it is chaos for as long as it lasts. I mean, it's almost guaranteed we're going to see a finish in this one. Uh, I, I Can I say equal? I mean, I I don't know how to choose between these two. I can't wait for both of them. So the current lineup as far as announced 300 fights are as follows. Bo Nickel versus Cody Brendage, Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling, Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian, Yuri Prochaska versus Alexander Rakic. We'll be talking to him in about 15 minutes. Leon Edwards has said that uh, he suspects he'll be on the card and we suspect it will be against Bilal Muhammad. So if you want to throw that into the mix, go ahead. Other than that, no real inclination as to the other big fights, the quote-unquote rabbit in the hat, the main event, all that stuff. Why are you doing quote-unquote for something you said? <laughs> no, because now... You everyone, are the one... No, because the one my rabbit... I, I specifically said the rabbit was not a main event level fight. I specifically said that it was you know, a six out of seven on the wow scale. And yeah. then of course, as predicted, Wait, six out of ten. Six out of sorry, ten. sorry, six or seven out of oh, 10. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Six and, uh, and of course it, it was turned into rabbit in the hat, <laughs> meaning like, you know, Habib's coming back. Brock's coming back. Wait, he's G not. That's what it got turned That's into. That's what you told Which, me. Which by the way, the can I just say something? I, I don't believe for a second that there aren't multiple rabbits in their hat. Yeah. I know of one specifically. Yeah. I yeah. have too much respect for them as matchmakers and as showmen and as entertainers. Like, they know what this is. The same way yes. they got Brock, the same way they got DC and Jones. Remember, John Jones fought in late April. He beat OSP, and then they turned him around and flew him and DC and some others out to Good Morning America and had them sitting there for a fight that was happening two months later to headline UFC 200. Like, they make these fights big. They make these cards big, these anniversary cards, right? So they have something. Whether it's going to cut the mustard, it, 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 I, I don't know, because it feels like people's expectations are, like, almost... Yeah. Like, two ninety outsized. They have far. to have something playing, though, because 299 is now so stacked that, like, you would think they would shift some of these over to 300. If if they were in desperate need of of building the card, I think they have some things planned. People need to manage their expectations. It's like, also coming together now. Like you got Yuri on there, you got Aljo on there fighting Cater, moving up to one. These are all great. You got fights. Charles Oliveira fighting Armin Sarukian. Like Charles Oliveira being on the card is a big deal as well. Like Bo Nickel, of course. Uh, I mean, we only have like five fights announced, and it's there's all there's already some massive names on this card. There's there's nothing they could do at this moment, in my opinion, like that could make people happy with this card. Yeah, I mean the amount of threads that I've read, the amount of uh, this is the perfect card that like would never actually get booked. Like it feels like people will be let down it, no matter what because it, of the expectation. It's missing a megastar, and they don't have megastars. That's that's the conversation. They don't. Would you have be okay that. with Izzy versus Alex as the main event? Uh, not sure. you. Not you. Do you think the people would be okay? No. No. Now, when you say, okay, look, the UFC is going to try their best. You said it perfectly. The UFC is going to try their best to stack this card. They're going to try their best to put on the best fight possible. They're going to try to make a big splash. They they know UFC 300 matters, and that's what they're going to try to do. Ultimately, 
if they're unsuccessful in getting this crazy thing that everybody is expecting to happen, they're going to put on a great card, stack top to bottom, everybody's going to love it, and they're going to move on to the next event and just keep rolling. That is what's going to happen. Gregor in June, and, and then, then probably another back. John Jones fight in the summer, and like the yeah, the wheels just keep on turning. They're not upending their whole business for UFC sure. 300. It to is gonna to me, it feels like they got to like to meet the expectations. They would have to have like a wow factor, something that like no one is expecting, and they drop it out of nowhere, and it really makes people say wow, which might not happen. A rabbit in the hat. Yeah, uh, like, quote unquote. Quote unquote. I feel, yeah, by the way, yeah. I feel like we need to start selling this merch. Rabbit <laughs> in the hat. And by the way, the quote unquote is also like, uh, you know. When when I said to Chael about the um, the ten million or whatever, and then I said reportedly by who yes, by me, his by report, me. the rabbit of that is reported by yeah. me. Um, I was a little bit surprised. DP versus BST is a perfect three hundred fight too. Like it's not like yeah. I don't think anyone was saying two ninety nine needs a little extra oomph, right? Yeah, two ninety nine. I mean, obviously O'Malley Vera. Now you got DP and BSD in a five round co main. Gilbert Burns JDM. Curtis Blades, Jailton Almeida, Piotr Jan, Song Yudong, Kevin Holland, Michael Page, Pedro Munoz, Kyler Phillips, Mateus Gamrod, RDA. I mean, you've got some it. fights did on not that need card. It, right? You did not, did not need it. 299 didn't need it. 300 didn't need it either. Let's be real. Like, it's going to be a great card. It's going to be stacked top fight. to bottom. It's like, it's like, so badass. The, 300 is not missing that fight. 300 is missing the top of the bill. 300 is missing the super headliner, and it's just not going to... I don't see how it materializes. I would love to be shocked. I think every fan would love to, but I just don't see how that materializes. So ultimately, 299, 300, throw them on either because both of those are going to be pay-per-views that are tops for the year, for sure. I mean, just right now on Tapology, obviously, you, you just mentioned it, the, the Leon and Bilal. Just like looking at this, like Yuri Rakic, Olivera Sarukian, Cater Sterling, Nickel Brunage, if they continue putting them out at this quality for the entire card, it's going to be an unbelievable card. Do you think there's any chance, or would you like to see them do this, or just based off the tweets from last week, which I have to give them a lot of credit for, Tom Aspinall had a pretty good yes. stretch of tweets there oh, regarding Steve A. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Big Tom came out strong. It's almost like he had this revelation, like, wait a second, I'm about to get screwed here. Talking about the <laughs> boxing uh, politics, and here's Big Francis getting massive fights, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being handcuffed by this interim belt. Tom versus Stipe? I would love it. I don't think it'll happen. No. Yeah, I mean, I think Stipe himself I think the, said it's not going to happen. Yeah, and I think the, the Tom, yeah, he did. You're right. He responded on Twitter, but Tom um, doing this makes me feel even more that it's not going to happen. Why? It feels like a... I've been trying to have these talks and they're not going anywhere, so let me try the mm. public appeal because I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Yeah. Tom said he is ready, though. I mean, I, I have no doubt. He he only fought, like, how long was that fight? 60-something seconds? I know he was Yeah, I don't up. think this will be... He fought twice this year, and he fought for a total of, like, two minutes <laughs> or last year. and, like, 22 seconds. Yeah, uh, last year. It won't be Tom who's holding this one up. Yeah, and there are some strong um, rumors that they're going to go back to Manchester in the summer, and you would think that he would wow. be there you go. the perfect candidate for that. Um, but I would love to see him featured on a 300 type yeah. card. Yeah. If only they made that fight in November for the vacant title, and now he could have gone out and fought Surreal Gun on 300. Or he can still fight Surreal Gun. Um, defending the interim belt. Yeah. This is literally what it... By the way, I think people need to understand what interim oh, belts go. are supposed to <laughs> signify. This is literally... The case for an interim belt is literally when the champion is injured and cannot sure. defend. John Jones cannot defend his belt. There's no need to strip him. Interim title. Tom Aspinall defends. Against Stipe would be tremendous. I don't think that will happen. <clears throat> Cyril gone. Hey, you want a shot? Here you go. You're a European. There it goes. Manchester. It's in Europe. Oh, and I, I was thinking 300. Oh. I'm just worried. Honestly, I'm worried about the title fights. If you just look at the, the roster of champions, there's not a lot of people available no. to fight. No. People's expectation. Do you do you think the fan base will be let down if if the only title fight on three hundred is Leon Bilal? I mean, yes. Yeah. Oh man, I think. I mean, I think they'll so, be let down so, if it's so three title fights and uh, none of them feature <laughs> Conor right. McGregor fighting a unicorn right. on a you know like. You're right. 
I heard rumors Habib comes back and <laughs> takes on Islam. To get, oh, my God. Help can you it. imagine? Yeah, please. That's the rabbit. That's oh the rabbit. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's the Habib rabbit. Versus Islam. Oh, my God. Could you Family imagine? turned against each other. Best yes. friends. And then, like, everyone has to decide. Usman has to decide oh, who he trains with. Decide. Umar has to decide. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Um, yeah. I, I love how every video I see is, like, predicting UFC 300. Like, 300 has become such a thing where I don't even know how I would build UFC 300 yeah. a thread a thread I don't even know if uh if 200 was talked about this much I don't know maybe it's was it this debate? different era something that's yeah. why magical about 300 man special number something, something. reminds me of when I used to do the numbered episodes and like I put so much pressure on booking the perfect 300 episode and then I stopped it was after 400 I stopped because I was like this is too much pressure by the way it's not even the 300th card in UFC history it's yeah. like the 900 or 700 or whatever it is. By the way, two also, 200 also had John Jones and DC at the top of it. Original, like, you know what I mean? Like, they, there wasn't, you didn't need to do the whole, like, what's going to come because they already had the best you could yeah, do. Yeah, but to my point, it, they waited quite a while. I don't remember. I mean, that's yeah, it was more end, your... It was end of April. John and, Jones had to fight OSP. It was, I think, April 25th. Believe it or not. And then, remember he almost didn't make it to the OSP fight because he got arrested. Yes. I mean, he was literally in like the orange jumpsuit two weeks before the fight in yeah. court. He fights OSP 197. This is the greatest stretch in UFC history. I'm going to yeah. write a book about this stretch one day. Between, We're waiting on it, man. Between March of 2016 to essentially August of 2016, it's the greatest stretch in UFC history, without a doubt. Connor Nate. That's 196. 196. 197 yeah. is the return of John Jones in the jumpsuit OSP. <laughs> on the Monday, by the way, on the Friday before that fight, it's the infamous Nate Diaz press conference with Connor, and there's the empty chair, and Nate says, you know, I'm not fighting on 200 unless he's fighting on 200. Then the Monday after 197, after John has a ho-hum win over OSP, they go on Good Morning America, and it's DC and Jones sitting there, the 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 the, the big rematch fight, which never yep. comes to fruition, of course. Uh, so that's 197. 198, Stipe knocks out Fabricio Verdum. 199, Bisping knocks out Rockhold. 200, Brock, all the hoopla. 201, Woodley knocks out Robbie Lawler. Oh, by the way, two weeks before that, right after 200, the company gets sold for $4.025 billion. 202, Connor returns. 203, CM Punk and, uh, and Stipe, uh, Stipe and Overeem. Yeah. Uh, 204, if you want to keep going, is, uh, is Manchester, Bisping versus Hendo. 205, oh, by the way, Conor McGregor back at Madison Square Garden. Uh, 206 was like, you know, not back, first time at Madison, double champion. Uh, 206 was the OK one in Toronto that was Pettis and Holloway and uh, Pettis miss weight, if you recall. It was supposed to be DC versus Rumble. Yeah. And, and then 207 was, was Ronda against Nunes. Yeah. Big what did we stretch. say we were calling the book? Highway to Hawani. No, no, that's no, the no, personal no, book. Sweet 16? Oh, wow, that's a good oh, name. Did we ever talk about this? This is part of the larger book. book. No, no, no. This, separate. this is just Hawani's... Uh, his, yeah. PO, he is, his POV of 2016, <laughs> the most magical year in UFC well, history. But, but why are we waiting? So why is this <laughs> that's book not out yet? We've had this whole discussion before behind the scenes of why are we waiting? This needs to... Let's let's work up some drafts. We know an author. I mean, we can, we can get this thing published. Who, TST? Yeah, <laughs> he's already working on book Shut number up. two. Let's shelf that and let's get Sweet Sixteen. Oh rolling. my God, um, Sweet Sixteen, the most magical year in UFC history wow. through my eyes. Through my eyes, yeah. An original novel by Ariel Helwani. Do you think we should come out with that first or Hel yes. Highway to Helwani? No, no, no. no, no. This, why Highway to Helwani when the story's done? Oh, like like yeah. when I'm sixty. 70. When, yeah. when you're in your coastal coffee shop and you got your uh, VW parked outside, that's when you type that one up on, on the old typewriter. Do it right now. 216? Yes. Is it okay if the I... year's already happened. Is it okay if I don't write it and I just, like, say it to someone? Yes, ghostwriting. Yeah. Is that, a, is that one okay of those for too. a media guy? No I feel like that's kind of frowned upon if you're a media guy. No, you, what was the last article ooh, you wrote? Who's <laughs> Come on, I mean, if, I mean... We had the Substack. We were rolling. Shout out to the Substack, yeah. <laughs> Is that how we're going to release? Look, you, you'll <laughs> in weekly installments. You'll do all the you'll do all the interviews. You'll roll out all the video content. You're still part of the process. You just didn't have to physically write it. It's fine. Well, you didn't put pen to paper, you didn't but, put pen to paper, but you but did you're write the author of this story. Forward by Oh, yeah, who's the forward by? Dana White. I'll write it. Dana White. Imagine Dana Connor White. McGregor. Who's the, yeah, I was going to say yeah, probably Connor, right? The most integral figure in the in the 2016. Yeah, 196, 202, and 205. 
There you go. And he became the first double champ, and he's the yeah, no, no, he biggest was, UFC right. fighter. I'm getting in contact with the publisher. Yeah, or Ronda, the comeback fighter of the year that year. <laughs> Listen, the bookend for that, the capper, the capper on that one. Or Punk, CM Punk. Let me do I mean, the let me do the afterword. Yeah, I was gonna say that's how you pro, finish the, the uh, epilogue. In such an incredible magical year, there could only be one fighter of the year, Miss Ronda Rousey. No, no, it was comeback. It was comeback. Comeback, comeback fighter of the year. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Could only be one. Uh, fighter. Yeah, let me do let me do the epilogue. I'll uh, I'll wax poetic. By the way, me and Ronda, I interview her and you know put that at the very end. I mean, we're talking here. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, you just got me excited. It is an incredible year. Like I mean, it was just banger after banger. It really was. Start writing um, it up. By the way, you know what's the craziest factoid about that year? The fight of the year, by the way, the fight of the year of 2016, you know what it was? Condit Lawler. Lawler, which happened on what day? January. Second. The second day of the year in the most magical year in UFC history produced the fight of the year. That's a yeah. crazy fight. 195. It's crazy. People don't know these things. Got to write it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move along. Back to UFC 300 talks. We're going through the fights. So happy that our old friend Alexander Rakic is back. We have not seen him since May of 2022. It has been that long, but he is back. We were going to see him back in January, or actually this January, in just a couple of weeks. But uh, unfortunately, his scheduled opponent, Jan Bachovic, forced to withdraw due to a shoulder injury. So he has to wait a little longer. He is going to be fighting the former light heavyweight champion, Yuri Prochaska. Let's go out to Vienna and say hello to our old friend Alexander Rakic. There he is. Long time hey, no see, my, my friend. friend. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. How are you? I'm doing great. Welcome back. <laughs> it's great to see you Thank back you. in the mix. Okay, so we yeah. have a lot to discuss because it has been a while. You were supposed to yeah. fight in January. You were supposed to fight in 12 <laughs> days from now. And obviously it didn't happen. How close were you to staying on the card, to getting someone to uh, replace Jan and, and having you fight in Toronto? Mm, yeah, uh, I mean, basically, I started the camp, and three days later, Jan canceled the fight. So I immediately knew who I want to fight next, and that's Yuri Prohaska. I called him immediately out because everybody was booked or is injured. So the uh, only Alex Pereira, the champion, and Yuri Prohaska were free. So. Probably the UFC will not give me the title shot after I lost my last fight uh, by injury. But uh, yeah, there was only one call to make uh, Yuri Pro to to fight Yuri Prohaska, and uh, yeah, we did it. I'm very happy to got this fight. Um, how come uh, you have to wait three more months? Is that because he wanted to wait, or you wanted more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a discussion, um, you know. He said he want to fight uh, February or March, so I gave him a date. Let's go in February. Then he he said he can't make February. He can make he can make March. So March didn't work for me out. So you know I talked to Mick Maynard and he offered uh, me and probably him UFC 300. And I said let's go, baby. It's the best. It, it will be the best UFC by far, and it's a great uh, it's a great opportunity for a great comeback. Uh, because it has been so long since you last fought, is it a blessing that you get more time to prepare or does this make you even more anxious because you have to wait almost now two years to fight again? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a long period of time. I was recovering really long for that knee injury, you know. Uh, it didn't go like uh, like 100% everything well, but uh, now I'm 100% ready, you know, and... Uh, Man, I'm really motivated. Not fighting for two years, but being on, you know, all the time. I'm, I I watched millions of fights. I've trained, you know, a lot, and uh, I was always watching the division moving on, you know. And that, uh, you know, the fire in in myself were burning, you know. And uh, I'm really motivated. I've never been so motivated for a fight like this, you know, against this opponent and on this show. So. Yeah, I, I I counting the days, the seconds, and the and the hours. <laughs> so you said that uh, it didn't go one hundred percent the recovery. What what went wrong? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, after the surgery, I start a little bit too fast, too too much intensity, you know, and then, you know, 
the body reacts, the knee got swallow, and, and then I need to stop, then I can come back again. And it's, you know, like every injury, it's not it's not going like a 100% up, you know, it's a roller coaster. It goes sometimes up, sometimes down, you know, but uh, this made me a better fighter and a better uh, athlete, you know. I, I'm in this period of time, I learned a lot of uh, to be patient, to be calm, you know. Usually, I'm a, a, before uh, I was a, a person who were not calm, you know, want everything really fast, really uh, immediate, immediately now. But now I'm calm, you know, and, and um, I'm, I'm, I have more patience. And I think uh, this version of Alexander Rakic is, a, is an upgrade. It's a 3.0 rocket and uh, it's it making me only a better fighter. When you think back to those early days, you know, after the surgery, uh, June, July 2022 now, how difficult was that time for you? The the thought of the long road back. You're in your prime. You're you're getting very close to realizing your dream, and now you have this major setback. What was it like? Oh, it was a, it was a nightmare for me. It was a really hell, you know, seeing those all all guys fighting. You know, Yuri, Glover, Hill, you know, Uncle Life, Jan. They are all my rivals, you know, and they're fighting. It's like the kids are playing outside, and you are behind the window was watching them, and you are not able to play with them, you know. So, uh, but like I said, I went to really dark places, you know, and uh, this made me only tougher, you know, mentally. So, like I said, uh, I've been working really on my techniques, you know, in every aspect of the game, and. Uh, I can promise you that uh, the version of Alexander Rakic, the new version of Alexander Rakic, uh, it's a different, different, different version, you know, in 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 a better way. So it needed to be, you know. It's I believing in God, and that that was God's plan, you know. And uh, you know, I've been through this. So and if I if I if I survive these two years, then the other next two, three, four years can come, I, I will handle this easy. This was the hard part for me now. Would you say this was the toughest stretch of your life? 100%. Yes, this was the 100 I had before two ACL surgeries on my left knee, even before the UFC back in the days. Uh, but this one was the hardest one. What's the difference? Uh, I, I think, you know, because I, I was in a place in the UFC in the top five, you know, and uh, I didn't want to lose my spot. I wanted to be uh, really fast back on track, you know. But these kind of injuries takes time, you know. So it was also a little bit pressure of, of um, you know, pressure to having stress, you know, to be right back in the picture. Uh, and the other, other way, you know, uh, I realized how much I trained after the surgery and then comparing the training, what I did after the last surgery and the first two surgeries, uh, you know uh, the last one i trained a lot you know so of course the body says hey give me some time i need to rest you know because after the fight you know after the surgery i was so motivated you know to get back but i forgot how much time this uh healing process needs you know uh were you able to watch those fights live you know like all the light heavyweight fights that were happening in your absence <laughs> Yeah, I, I watched pretty pretty every every light heavyweight uh, life. You know, it was like, you know, every time watching those guys, uh, my heartbeat goes up. You know, and uh, just uh, I'm happy that the division is moving. You know, the belt is changing. You know, and uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of like we will see what's going on for the next month. You know, who gonna Pereira? Who gonna be fighting next? So, yeah, and uh, after April, uh, after the fight against Yuri, some uh, things going to change for sure. It must have been, um, I'm, I'm assuming, especially weird, just because like the belt was just bouncing around and then the whole thing that happened last winter with uh, Yuri getting hurt and then Jan and Ankalaev and then Hill gets the title shot kind of, you know, out of nowhere with Glover. Like, I'm assuming there was a part of you thinking if I was healthy, this would have been me. Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, this division after the injury, this division, you know, it, it, it was like a voodoo magic on that division, you know. Uh, Yuri was champion, then he injured himself, then Hill was champion, he injured himself, you know. 
you know, I was like, oh, what the fuck, where I am now, you know. But, you know, that's that's the, that's the way how it is, you know. And, uh, yeah, the, the division is moving on, you know, and, and that's, that's important, you know. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, I have now a... That I have now a date, you know, that I have a name and I'm really happy to make my comeback, you know, and uh, to prove all the guys over there, you know, that uh, the rocket is still on fire. And, and one last thing about the recovery. When you say dark places, what do you mean by that? I mean, you always, you know, think when uh, some things don't go well, you know, you think about your life, your career, what to do, you know, and... Uh, you know, in some periods of time, you know, you think, is this the right thing for me? Then after one minute, say, of course it is. You know, it's a roller coaster, you know, and there have some, there have been some days, you know, some, some days where really uh, you, you think, is this the real uh, thing for you, you know? But, uh, you know, deep in my mind, you know, deep in myself, I knew, I knew that uh, this is just, uh, this is just a small adventure, you know, and I'm going to soon I'm going to be right back on track where I belong, you know, and this is uh, the title run. How did you get out of that? What did you do to kind of get uh, back on track? I, I took I took my time, you know, my family was a big factor. You know, I talk a lot for my family. My family are supporting me, you know, and then uh, slowly the trainings, you know, and after every training, you know, if you if you see the success, you know, if you. You know, after every training, I set some goals before the training. And when I achieved the goals, you know, this made me really happy. And then I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a, a very disciplined person and I'm very mentally strong person. And uh, this made me only tougher in my mind. So, uh, yeah, like I said, those things maybe needed to happen because they made me a better athlete now, uh, more hungry more uh, patient, but uh, still uh, sharp, you know, more ice cold, you know. And uh, this is, I think, this will be the full version of, of Alexander Rakic. This is the point where, where what was missing, you know, to be calm in some places, to believe in yourself, to help the self-confidence, even if you train less than your, uh, than your uh, opponents and... This this is the thing what what we're missing, you know. Before, when, when did you feel like you were a hundred percent? Oh, this summer, like August, okay. uh, August September. Yeah, it was like uh, when I started to wrestle, you know, uh, because wrestling is the ultimate test. It's the most stress on the knee, and if the knee can handle the wrestling exchanges, then you are ready to go. And I start hard wrestling in August uh, in September. And then I knew, okay, I'm ready, you know. So you had two ACL surgeries on your left and one on your right? Yes, sir. Was there any part of you that really was worried that you wouldn't come back to 100%? Uh, you mean now or before? No, like, yeah, you know, maybe a year or so ago. <clears throat> you know, like I said, these two ACL surgeries I had even before my UFC career, you okay. know. And I made it to the UFC I made it to the top, the best placing in, in the rankings were number two with two ACLs before the UFC. So I told my doctor, he did the right knee, the same doctor I did my left knees, told him, doc, you did now my right knee, now we're going to be world champions. You know? <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm coming always, I know myself and I love to prove people wrong. I know, and this is in my DNA and this is my Serbian mentality. You know, we are all of that, you know, in Serbia. We love to to, to prove people wrong. So uh, I want to say that uh, I'm always, I come always uh, better after every surgery, uh, after every injury what I had. So I saw... And I'm, I'm really believing in that, you know, and, and, and I know it, I felt it, you know. Even now in, this, in the short period of time when I had the camp for the Jan fight, you know, in the camp, I, I, I start to see... In the sparring, you know, I was, uh, I, I I was more more experienced, more uh, worked with the head, not not so much with the body, you know. You know what I mean, um, you know what I mean, uh, to not uh, going like with the head through the wall, you know. Just so this part we're missing, you know. And now I got this, 
And this needed to happen. This needed to happen to to show me what calmness is, to show me what passion is, and to show me what real self confidence is. Where where do you stand with Jan? Because uh, there were some tweets back and forth when the fight got uh, canceled. How do you how do you feel about him now? <clears throat> uh, I mean, I wish him a fast recovery. Uh, I mean, uh, no, I, I don't wish nobody any injuries and. Uh, like uh, he he decided to do the surgery shoulder surgeries now. I think he had these problems before, even uh, in before fights. So I'm a little bit, you know, I asking myself why he's canceling the fight uh, with me twice because in the first fight he canceled he canceled the fight. Then six weeks later we fought. Now he canceled again. He never canceled the fight before. He fought against Ankalaev, Pereira, uh, Glover. Uh, he never talked about this, uh, that there were, the shoulders were very bad, you know, and now he decided to, to make surgery on the shoulders. So yeah, uh, like I said, I wish him a fast recovery and, uh, yeah, for me, it's even, I, I got an even better fight on an even better card. And for me, it was a win-win situation. Okay. I was just going to ask you, uh, which opponent kind of excites you more and it sounds like Yuri excites you more why is that yeah i mean if you ask me of course i want uh, i want uh, to to close this chapter with jan you know but i i really don't feel that uh, i lost that fight uh, that that i lost the fight against jan because he was the better man i lost the fight because i injured myself and i beat myself you know so this fight I didn't see as a revenge, you know. It was a, just a normal, regular fight. But I think uh, for the fans, he's more excited to fight Yuri Prohaska, you know. He's like, uh, he's from Czech Republic. I'm living in Austria. We are, like, really close to each other. You know, we are both Europeans. We are both young. And uh, we are, uh, he has a very exciting style, you know. And uh, so I love to test myself against, uh, like, a former champion and, and like, a, like this style, you know, and like I said, like Connor says, styles makes fights, you know, and I want to test myself against his style because uh, I see uh, many good things what he's da- doing, but I see also many, many holes in his game, you know, and uh, yeah, if I can close up these holes, it's going to be a good night for me. Can I ask which holes you see? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, uh, if you see if you see the fights uh, with uh, Yiri, he got almost in every UFC fight he got dropped. You know, so uh, I would not say that his his chin is weak, but he he you know he feel the punches really different than, for example, me. And uh, I was really surprised about the takedown against Pereira. He did it very well. Uh, yeah. This is this is one of the holes, you know, to to be almost every fight, almost losing, and then the other thing is the good thing is he's always coming back and always uh, finish strong. So this is also a, a good thing about him, you know. He is, uh, you know, you just need to be careful and to be focused with him all the time. Were you surprised he lost to Pereira? Uh, mm, uh no, but I was also not. Uh, you know, when you if you if 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 you ask me who who you think you w- would win against Pereira and Yuri, I would say it's a fifty fifty. But uh, he did a very good job until he got knocked out. I mean, he was leading. He was he was uh, he was winning that fight. You know, first round he was winning. Second, yeah, I mean, he rushed a little bit too much. And Pereira, what Pereira did very good, he 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 kept uh, he he be he kept focused, you know, he kept focusing, and he didn't uh, he didn't panic. So, you know, that just, you you can see that he's a very experienced guy. So, and it was like in the beginning, it was for me like a, looks like like an early stoppage, but then Yuri said it wasn't a Yuri stoppage. So, if he says that, then all credits to the champ, you know. How do you how do you feel about Alex being the light heavyweight champion? He he just fought once at two oh five. He beat Dion in July, and then he got the title shot. Um, so much as I mean, who could have predicted this two years ago when you were when you were last fighting? Are you surprised about this? How do you feel about this? Oh, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, when I hear that Alex come to light heavyweight, I was really happy because uh, you know the 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 division gets uh, gets uh, interesting again, and uh, he's a big star in the UFC, and the UFC promoting him very well. He's fighting very good, you know, and uh, I think we have a, a good kickboxer as a UFC champion in the light heavyweight division. Okay, do you feel like if you beat Yuri, you're getting a title shot? I, I think if I beat Yuri in good fashion and good, with, a, with a good performance, I would be in the uh, title picture uh, straight away. I don't know what's uh, how long he's going to take for, for the recovery. I, we don't know what's going to happen about the winner against... Um, uh, if the winner of Ankalaev and Walker, what they're going to do. But uh, I, I believe, you know, if I beat Yuri in good fashion... I would be right in into the mix. Do you think Alex is going to fight someone on 300? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, maybe you you don't know, you know, maybe if if uh, the fight on Saturday goes really fast, you know, first round, second round, uh, very good fashion, you know, the the UFC uh wants a big show and it would be a good uh, good fight as well, you know. And would love to fight on the same card as right. Alex, you know, and, you know, would be good. So who who do you like in this fight on Saturday? Obviously, they fought in uh, October. Johnny Walker and Magomed Ankalaev, yeah. it, it ended unceremoniously. So they're running it back this Saturday in the main event. Who do you like? Who do you like to fight or to no. win? Who, 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 do you, think... who do you think is going to win the fight? Uh, okay. Uh, honestly, I think Ankalaev is going to win that fight, you know. Not because... Uh, uh, he's a better fighter because he's a little bit, uh, he had makes smarter decisions, you know. Of course, Johnny Walker is an excited fighter to, to watch, you know. He is very, you know, uh, fun to watch. But when you, when it comes to mix things up, you know, again, wrestling, grappling and striking, I'd see Ankalaev has, uh, uh, has uh, the better, better tools to win the fight. Uh, would you be okay with uh, Alex waiting to fight Jamal like later on this summer or something like that and not fighting anyone else? If if this happened then uh, but I don't I don't think if if Ankalaev win that fight you know uh, they would give the the title shot to Ankalaev but if oh. yes then uh I if I win against Syria I would probably fight some somewhere somewhere else you know but anyways you know my tit- my 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 goal is the title you know and if they put in front of me another guy I need to to beat the other guy. You know, I was like two years now off. I need to work a lot now. But uh, you know, if you if you if the performance on UFC 300 is good and I finish him in the first round, it can go really fast. You know, how how big of a deal is this back home? Uh, you know, you live in in Vienna, as you said, in Austria. He's from the Czech Republic. This feels like a fight that would be huge in that part of the world. Hundred percent. This would be a banger, you know. And uh, I would say, if this fight is in a stadium, that stadium would be full. You know? Wow. Uh, I have a I have a big community, you know, in Austria, in the German speaking uh, countries, and on the Balkans. You know, I'm representing mm-hmm. Serbia because I'm Serbian, and he is from from Czech Republic. You know, and uh, MMA in Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary is really big. They have some really big shows like Octagon and and something, you know. I've been now two months ago in an Octagon event in Germany, but the organization is uh, from Czech Republic and the stadium was full, 20,000 people. Yeah, I've heard their events are incredible. I mean, obviously I've seen them uh, on on the air here on DAZN, but like uh, I've heard they put on an incredible show. Were you impressed? Yeah. 100%. 100%. The UFC were in the same arena. I think UFC 99 in Germany, Köln. In the same arena, the UFC was not able to fill up the, the, the arena. Wow. And those guys did it, you know. So it's it's a really big thing. MMA is pretty big in, in, in Europe now. Is it... Uh, Getting you, more and more. Yeah. Would you say in that part of the world it's bigger than boxing now? Yes, it is. Yes, wow. because, uh, you know, we don't have any or they don't have any big names in boxing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so it's MMA, you know, and especially, you know, being in the top five, Yuri, me, and Jan, three guys from uh, right. Europe and living in the same, like, uh, like uh, 
living next to each other, basically. You know, everybody's excited. What did you miss the most about just being a UFC fighter? What 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 are you so excited to feel again, to experience again? Man, the fans, you know. You know, when I fought the last time in front of the crowd, this was against Volkan Uzdemir in Korea, wow. 2019. Wow, yeah. I fought three times in the COVID situation, three times the last three fights were in Apex, you know. I'm... I'm tired of this, you know. I want to feel the crowd. I want to feel the people. I want to feel the atmosphere, you know. Yeah, before, if you ask me uh, where you want to fight, you know, in front of a big crowd or in Apex, I said before, I doesn't care. I fight in front of the parking. Right. And it is like this. I don't care. I fight in front of the parking. But the, the, the crowd and the people give you extra motivation, you know. And uh, I like to perform and I love to perform in front of cameras and people. Uh, and even on that show, UFC 300 right, is yeah. going to be amazing. It's going to be big. What an honor. The bigger the show, the bigger, the, yes, the bigger the show, the better version of myself. Um, last thing, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, an old foe of yours, Anthony Smith, fought on short notice against Khalil Roundtree, who's looked incredible as of late. And uh, since then, you know, Anthony lost the fight and he talked about being in a dark place afterwards. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, everything that he's dealing with after taking that fight on short notice? Yeah, it was a really hard, hard fight. I mean, a really hard finish for him. And he said, I think it was the hardest uh, finish. I mean, what he felt. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the, this is the thing on short notice uh, fights, you're taking on short notice fights. Either, either you, you losing or you winning and being the hero of the night, you know? Uh, against uh, Khalil, you know, very fantastic Muay Thai fighter. Um, I feel 100% what he's feeling now, you know, and uh, but he need to go through these dark places and I think uh, he he been many times in that, you know. So but he will get back and he will get back on track, uh, you know. He's a he's a good guy, you know, and he has balls. He's he fought basically everybody in the division. He don't care. Right. He's fighting, you know. Khalil's a player, right? Like he's a he's a serious. I think he's he's a contender. Yeah, yeah, he's excited. He's a hard dude, you know, to fight, you know, and uh, but he's beatable, like everybody in the division. Right. Well, uh, great <laughs> to have you back, my friend. Uh, so happy for Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Was looking forward to your return in Canada, but uh, three hundred is a pretty special card, so I would say it all worked out. And uh, what a fight against yeah. uh, Yuri. Gosh, what a what a matchup. It's so yeah. important at 205. So thank you for the time. Appreciate it very much. Good luck in training. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, my man. Thank you. All right. Thank there you. he is, Alexander Rakic. Yes, uh, representing uh, both Serbia and Austria. Uh, another fight. Maybe by the time... Uh, this card is all said and done. We'll, we'll, or you know, when it when it actually comes to fruition on April thirteenth, maybe we'll actually uh, speak to every single fighter on the card. Wouldn't that be something? Actually, maybe there's a couple that we won't get to talk to. But I mean, we can get pretty close, considering where we are right now. Uh, we can get pretty darn close. UFC two ninety seven is the next pay per view. Of course, uh, UFC is back this weekend. That is. The one that we just talked about, Johnny Walker versus Magomed Ankalaev. First show of the year, baby. Back at the apex. Yeah. Way to kick things off. Yeah. It is a good main event. Remember that weird ending back in October in Abu Dhabi. So we get Johnny Walker versus Magomed Ankalaev. Mateus Nikolaou against Manel Cape. Solid fight at 125. That's a fun one. That is the uh, chief support. Jim Miller returning. Perhaps this is the uh, the fight that gets him on 300. He has said that that's what he wants against Mowgli Benitez. Always a fun fighter. Uh, Ricky Simone against Mario Bautista. Phil Hawes against Bruno Ferreira. Andre Arlovsky back against Waldo Cortez Acosta. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Taylor Lapilus. Tom Nolan. A solid little card. That's this Saturday on ESPN Plus. Prelim start at four. How about that? In the midst of the NFL playoffs, first pay-per-view coming up, Sean Strickland versus Drickus Duplessis. That's the 
main event for the middleweight title. Obviously, we get the uh, vacant bantamweight title fight. Raquel Pennington versus Myra Buena Silva, uh, friend of the program, Juliana Pena, hopefully getting the winner. Arnold Allen versus Mosar Evloev, very important fight at 145. Neil Magny against Mike Malott. Brad Katona against Garrett Armfield. Jillian Robertson against Poliana Viana. Who else is on there? Chris Curtis against Marc-André Barrio. Malcolm Gordon against Jimmy Flick. Charles Jordan against Sean Woodson. That's a fun one. And what about Priscilla Cachuera against Jasmine? Jazz the busiest. Yeah. Or Yasmin? Jazz the busiest. Yeah. Back in the mix, our old pal. Uh, coming off the tough loss to Tracy Cortez back at UFC Noche. Looking forward to her getting back and looking forward to uh, a big show back in the T Dot, back in the six, back at the Scotia Bank Arena, formerly known as Air Canada. Yes, the busiest. It has been a while. 2019 was the last show. December of 2019 was the last show uh, at Scotia Bank. Home of your Raptors, RJ Barrett, Manuel Quickly, that trade looking good for them. And uh, also looking good for the Knicks, 4-0. I was about to say, it's, yeah, it's probably looking better for the Knicks. Nah, I mean, we're both undefeated. Yeah, the... Uh, RJ well, RJ scored 37 points, I think it was, yesterday. RJ's problem was never scoring points. It's the efficiency. Yeah. Dude, OG is something. Shoot. OG is something, huh? OG is... I mean, you, who was... What, are, what was my uh, yeah, you were high of on that it. trade? You were high on it. I was sad OG about... OG is a, is, a, is a winning basketball player. That dude... Free I, and I D. Would, I would... Tr- I would have traded Donovan Mitchell for OG straight up right now. Wow. Really? I mean, there, there's a benefit. I think uh, Garland and, and Mitchell have some duplication, so that's, that's part true. of the equation. Uh, but I love OG. I think he's I such love a, too. an amazing basketball player. I love his demeanor as well. He, he will never detract from your basketball team. He will only add. Yeah. There will never be nights where you're like, man, OG really killed us. There will be nights where where RJ Barrett's building a brick house, and you'll be like, oh, man, this is rough. You, OG will never have that night. IQ might end up being the better player. I love I love Quickly, too. He's another one. Man, so much going on in the world of sports. And, of course, it's always so fun when the Venn diagram that is MMA and boxing come together, and there's that little slice right there and that's where we reside i mean this is this is where this is where we really shine when you got that mma circle you got that boxing circle and they come together like this by the way i was talking about saturday ufc is back don't forget about archer better Biev and callum smith and i can let you know that callum smith who is looking to shock the world in quebec city la belle province this saturday it's on ESPN Plus, that's probably why the card is starting early. Oh, that's a good back-to-back there on ESPN. Uh, He's going to join us on Wednesday's program. So we've got uh, the Brit who's going into enemy territory. Of course, we were supposed to get this fight like six months ago. Better be have had a little issue with his uh, teeth. And so now we suspect that the winner of this fight is, uh, you know, is in line for a massive fight. A massive fight against Dimitri Bivol, who we just saw back on December 23rd at Day of Reckoning. So it's all coming together, but this is really where we love to uh, reside when the two worlds come together. And we found out on Friday, courtesy of your boy, who obviously got it from uh, His Excellency, Mr. Turkey Al Sheikh. Um, and it's okay. It's okay that everyone credited him and didn't credit me. And it's okay that all the boxing media kind of boxed us out. That's fine. Actually, Dan Rayfield gave us a uh, prop. So uh, shout out to the veteran. Uh, It is going down in March. And as Francis told us earlier in the day, March 8th, that's a Friday. And what a weekend that's shaping up to be, right? And like I told you, what a four-week stretch in Saudi Arabia. February 17th, Alexander Usyk, Tyson Fury, undisputed heavyweight title fight. February 24th, looking more and more likely that we're going to get the big PFL versus Bellator super fight card, if you will, also back in Saudi Arabia. March 2nd, UFC's debut in Saudi Arabia. And then the following weekend, rounding out Riyadh season, is uh, this potential mega fight. And there's all kinds of talk, all kinds of rumors 
about the other names. If, uh, you know, the other names that would be on this card, if December 23rd is any indication, and to a degree, the October 28th card, you know there's going to be big names, and Queensberry's involved. So, you know, one wonders if the likes of Gilei Zhang going to be involved, Deontay Wilder, uh, maybe a little Joe Joyce action. Who knows? Maybe some... Uh, Jayopatai, who looked great on that December 23rd card as well. The possibilities are endless. But the big one, of course, is AJ versus uh, Francis. Ten rounds, no gimmicks, no no knockdown rule, three judges. Um, you got everything. You got everything that you want. It's a, it's a regular fight. It's not an exhibition. It's going on their records. And you have to think, AJ wins this fight. He's very much in the Tyson Fury slash undisputed title fight sweepstakes. You have to think Francis wins this fight. He's in the same boat. And what's great about it is AJ has the history with uh, Tyson. He has the history with Usyk. Francis has the history with Francis, excuse me, with uh, Tyson as well. Like it's all kind of intertwined. And here's big Francis just wedging his way in the midst of all of this. It's a beautiful thing. It's an incredible thing. Who could have saw this coming just a few months ago? Maybe some of us over here. Um, but it's crazy to see it all come to fruition. And like I said earlier, and like I said to Francis, it does feel like there's a lot more positivity, a lot more excitement, a lot more um, buzz. Not a lot of belly aching about this one. There's going to be the, you know, the hardcore boxing pundit, hardcore boxing fan. They're going to come out and say, ah, oh, he should fight Hergovich. Ah, oh, he should fight Jile Zhang. But in reality, I mean, like, this fight kind of makes a lot of sense. After what happened on October 28th, from a sporting meritocracy perspective, it's not crazy at all. And if you go back to my tweets on December 23rd, after Deontay Wilder lost to Joseph Parker, and after Anthony Joshua beat up Otto Valin, I said, that's the fight to make. And a lot of people gave me shit on that night. Go back to the tweet. December 23rd, uh, that's not the fight, that's not the fight, he's going to fight Hergovich, blah, blah, blah. What happens? We're getting it in about two months' time in Saudi Arabia, the one I've been asking for, the one many MMA fans have been asking for since October 28th. It's going to be Francis Ngannou versus Anthony Joshua, the man who helped put it together, the head man over at Matchroom Boxing. I think he's here, unless he's in bed sleeping from his crazy facts. Fast, he is there. He, you look fantastic. Wow, you dropped Thank how, you. Many, how many stone, Eddie? How do, how do you... Uh... Um, I've dropped, I'm about three kilos in at the moment, four kilos, but I've, I've got 22 hours to go on the fast. Why are you doing this, Eddie? I just, I'm, I'm learning, Ariel. I'm reading, I'm being convinced, maybe slightly deluded. I don't know. I'm just trying to improve myself. You know, I will, you know, I will have to, a lot of people have been DMing me saying you're just a poor man's Dana White <laughs> and like, you know, <laughs> Gary Parker, who he thought I had, I have been reading his stuff and I just, you know, I want to get there. I want to feel better. I want to be healthier. So if I make it till tomorrow, I'll let you know. And, and so far you're enjoying it. Like, would you do this again? I wouldn't say I was enjoying it. No, okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm remarkably not hungry. Wow. I know. I am I am 50 hours in with no food and I'm not hungry. Any kind of liquid? Yeah, oh yeah, water and electrolytes. You allow bone broth. I've not had that. I've just had water and electrolytes. So I'm well hydrated. Um it's fun. I think it's a good mental challenge. It's difficult, you know. I was on, I was on a flight for 8 hours. And they've got these really nice chocolates, you know, these Lindor chocolates oh, yeah, yeah. and they were in a basket and I kept walking past them. And I was like no one would ever know. But I would, and that's yeah. enough. Because when I set my mind to something like this, I ain't losing. So tomorrow night, we feast. And and a little cheeky coffee, like an espresso, nothing like that? No. Wow. No. Kudos to you. Uh, that is that is impressive. Okay, so uh, obviously I, I said I wasn't going to keep you long. Last time I kept you probably like 30 minutes too long, and your whole team got mad because you had a meeting or something in uh, L.A., so I apologize for that. We're not going to keep you long, especially given the state that you're in, but we're obviously here to talk about the big news, uh, massive news. I mean, the, the, this is what everyone's talking about. Luke Littler. You broke it. Well, no, I was talking about Luke Littler. Oh, Luke Littler. Yeah. <laughs> that was the big. Uh, what but, about that? What about on. that? Unbelievable, right? I mean, if darts couldn't get any bigger, you yeah. know, I mean, we've gone from 1.6 million biggest TV audience 
to like 4.5 million. I mean, the whole nation, Ariel, was literally talking about this kid. You couldn't go down the street without someone. You watching Live Litter tonight? It was a phenomenon. And, you know, obviously the, the fairy tale ended and didn't quite materialise, but hey, you know, it can come again. Just amazing that you can get a 16-year-old kid that can go up there under that kind of pressure on a stage. And and for probably a lot of your fans watching right now, they're thinking, what on earth are they talking no, about? No, no. The World Darts Championship, Alexandra Palace, you know. Um, it was amazing. It, 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 it was the best free publicity we could have got to grow, to continue to grow this sport globally. And particularly in America, you know, front page CNN website, like it was everywhere, New York Times. So, yeah, it's uh, it's funny now, you know, the board, which I'm chairman of, we, we, we start talking about, you know, there is a, a care of duty to protect a young person from, you know, almost like the nastiness of success. You know, all of a sudden he's got, he had media camped outside his house, photographers chasing him down the street. Like, and, and we had a difficult decision because we have Premier League darts coming up. And there was a feeling that, is it too early for him? You know, he's 16. Should we remove this pressure for him? Let him develop, let him, you know, really digest the experience of the World Championship. I'm the other way. I'm like, don't be silly. He's on fire. Sling him in. <laughs> you know, and I just feel like he's that kind of kid. You know, he, he, was, he was lapping it up. And um, what a great addition. It just shows you, that young people are playing darts. You know, the kid won $300,000 in one tournament, you know, and plus the sponsorship and everything that's going to come with it. So big career for him. And I love the promo. The next day you have the promo and it has all the guys. For a minute, yeah. And then he, and he says he doesn't have to wake up for school. I mean, it was, exactly. it was brilliant. It was, it was very combat sports like with the, uh, you know, with the big reveal. And so speaking of combat sports, yes, on Friday evening, uh, we, we break the story that it is going to be your guy, AJ, against my guy, Francis, in Riyadh. <laughs> it's incredible stuff. So can I ask you, how did this get done? Because I saw an interview, uh, you were, I, I believe you were talking to, to your old mate, Charlie, and you were walking out of the arena, Charlie Parsons, in, um, in Riyadh on December 23rd, and this is right after AJ's win, and, and Wilder lost, and you said, I got to go to a meeting right now as you were leaving, right? You were doing a walk and talk. Did this fight get done that night? Was it that quick? I mean, it, it didn't get signed that night, but it was, you know, look, the way His Excellency Turkey El Sheikh that does business is, is quite remarkable. You know, and you saw that with your own breaking news just a few days ago. Um, following AJ's win, obviously, look, we were due to announce the Deontay Wilder fight in the ring that night. Wow. Both guys had signed a contract to announce the fight. And he was very excited. Obviously, it was one of them, you know, the, the most highly anticipated fights that could be made in a sport. It'd been four years in the making. Everyone was really excited. Obviously, Deontay Wilder lost. So from that moment, the clogs are turning in his mind. You know, what, what are we going to do on March the 8th, March 9th? You know, and it's like, as soon as the fight's finished, it's like, right, let's talk. And, you know, we, we had a, a meeting. Um, and I said to him, you know, I, I think it's the biggest fight out there. I said it to you when I came on the show. You're talking about two giants in Anthony Joshua and, and Francis Ngannou. You know, two men who look like they are carved out of stone. Two devastating punches. And I've always felt like it was the biggest fight out there. And, you know, I told him that and he felt the same. And, so these people move very quickly, you know, although obviously we were, we were working over Christmas and New Year's Eve to get the fight made. Um, it did move very quickly. And, you know, the, my, my favorite part of everything was literally 24 hours before you broke the news. You know, I had a conversation with his excellency and, and, you know, his associates, which was, you know, sort of nicely, Eddie, we know you've got a big mouth, just sort of leave it out, you know, avoid the interviews for a little bit. And then when you tweeted, I was like, what? <laughs> and then, you know, I, I then, I then messaged him and said, is this, you know, are you all right? Like I'm getting called now off the hook. Are you okay for me to comment on this? And it was like, yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to say too much as I said to you over, sure. over WhatsApp because the press conference is next Monday. Um, and all the details will be revealed there, but obviously delighted. Um, just a great fight. You know, everyone's going to play my, previous clips that Francis Ngannou couldn't win an English title before he fought Tyson Fury. 
I feel like he's earned that shot or, or certainly to continue at that level. And, and I fancy the fight. Like, you know, like you heard me say before, I really believe AJ knocked him out. Um, but it is a dangerous fight. I'm not, you know, I know that this guy's a big, big lump that can really punch. And I think he has no fear, which makes him dangerous, you know. But I just feel like AJ's in a great place. And I expect him to pick him apart and knock him out. Uh, my favorite thing, if I may, was uh, all the messages that I got saying, who did you get this from? And I was like, I yeah, actually yeah. said it in the video. I got it from you did. the man himself, if you weren't listening. And then my other favorite thing was all the boxing media refusing to credit me because I feel like they were like, fuck this guy, this MMA guy. Oh, you upset a lot of people. Yeah. No, yeah. that's fantastic. We're okay with that over here. Um, and so can I ask, did you have to convince Anthony of this? Because obviously famously he once said, and, and you relayed this and even Dana White famously relayed it, no, nah, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in titles. Did you have to get him on board as well? Or was he on board once you know he what? saw the Fury fight? Honestly, previous to the Fury fight, he, he really, it wasn't a fight that he was interested in. You know, obviously, we just boxed a guy in Otto Wallin that really gave Fury a, a really tough time, cut him, I think he had 48 stitches. The fight should have been stopped. Otto Wallin should have won that fight. But it is what it is. And AJ went out and it was a mismatch. He demolished him. And I believe we're going to do the same here. So that performance over Tyson Fury, of course, but you know, that that was really the the the, the point, the moment that made this fight credible. And I felt like he beat Tyson Fury. If if he didn't, it was a round either way. So you can't really say that he's not a credible opponent. Um, you know, I, I heard Carl Froch and others say, Oh, you know, this is just a cash grab. No, this is a dangerous fight. Like AJ actually has a lot to lose here. You know, coming off the wild fight, he's in a wonderful position to go and fight for the IBF world title, which we hope will happen after the Francis Ngannou fight. But it's kind of like there's a lot of jeopardy in this fight, a lot of jeopardy. If you lose to Francis Ngannou, Francis Ngannou is zero and one, right? So it's not a great look losing to Francis Ngannou. So he's going to do everything he can to avoid that. So... um it, it was never anything we anticipated, Eric, you know, because we thought that Deontay Wilder would win. We, we believe we win. And, and we just presumed we were fighting Deontay Wilder mm. on March the 9th. So we'd never really talked about Ngannou. The only time I talked about Ngannou was straight after the Fury fight. I thought, that is the fight to make. AJ Ngannou. What a fight. One of the biggest fights out there. But we didn't get anywhere. And I reached out to France's team, but... You know, they didn't really reply. And it took, once again, His Excellency to step in, speak to Francis and Garnu, and make the fight. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, I said it moved quickly, but AJ didn't really need a lot of convincing. You know, he, he's on a roll at the moment. He feels good after the Wilder fight. The only thing, I think, after the, the Wilder loss, he kind of switched off for a week or 10 days. He went on holiday and he had to cut his holiday short a few days ago to fly back and start camp. But he was going to do that anyway for Wilder. But I think when Wilder lost, maybe he just switched off a little bit. So he just needed to switch back on. And, um, oh, they're taking this very seriously. This is not, you know, in their mind, this is the toughest fight of their career. Francis Ngannou is a very dangerous man. Um, and they'll be training absolutely, you know, with every ounce in their soul to be victorious. Speaking of the camp, will he be with Ben Davison again? Yeah, I think that's, um, he's flown back to England. So, you know, he's going to make a decision pretty soon. There's, what, uh, eight weeks Saturday, I think, till the fight, uh, this Saturday coming. Um, and I think he'll talk to his team and see where it's best to train. Obviously, he had a great camp with Ben. And, you know, that decision was made really because of the lack of time against Otto Wallin. And, I think you might see him go out to Saudi a little bit earlier for this fight. Obviously, just three weeks before, you've got Usyk against uh, Fury out there. So, you know, that's our ultimate aim, is to fight the winner of that fight, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, I think he... I haven't talked to him too much about the details of his camp, but I guess he'll be putting it together this week. Uh, I know there's been talk of a rematch clause with Fury and Usyk. Do you have any knowledge as to if Fury wins... Could he fight AJ next if, if AJ wins as well? Or does the rematch clause both, go both ways? I, I don't know enough. I mean, I, I, as I understand it, it's a two-fight deal, which would mean a two-way rematch. Okay. Uh, but, you know, things change in boxing. 
you know, look, if Tyson Fury beats Alexander Usyk and AJ knocks out Francis Ngannou, you know, our, our plan is to probably go on and fight for the IBF world title. You know the entire world is going to say, give me AJ against uh, Tyson Fury. Like, it, there will never be a bigger fight in the history of the sport, in my opinion. So, uh, we'll see. But right now, everyone's just focused on, you know, I mean, two, you've got, you've got AJ against Ngannou, Fury against Usyk, all within three weeks of each other in the kingdom. I mean... It's madness. It, like the, the ability to get these fights done. And, and you know the one thing that makes me laugh, I've got to say, is people go, oh, don't you feel like you're taking boxing away from America or, or Britain? It's like, you know, there's this thing, it's called the world. <laughs> like boxing doesn't just have to exist in America and Britain. Of course, for me as a Brit, I want to bring as many big fights to our country as possible and with our business in America. But there's no, like, <laughs> just because another country has come in and started showing an interest in boxing. doesn't mean that it's a negative. It's a positive. Look at the fights that we're getting. You know, within three months of each other, you're getting the day of reckoning card. You know, you had Fury against Ngannou. You're getting AJ against Ngannou. Fury against Usyk, the undisputed heavyweight world championship. And look at the cards. I mean, again, you wait till you see the cards that, that are being put together for it. Like, it's mind blowing. And it's very exciting to be a part of, especially for a fight fan. It's like, you know, it's like championship manager. I don't know if you guys have that over there, where you're you're literally putting together all these dream scenarios in your sport. And it's happening like that. So we're embracing it. And hopefully it continues. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that, and I understand where you're coming from. But also, I did want to ask you about this that I said earlier in the day. I feel like there's a lot more excitement and positivity around this announcement, this fight, than when Francis was announced to fight Tyson, in large part because we saw what oh, Francis yeah. did. But I don't see a lot of the the old curmudgeonly boxing types, the fans on Twitter, crapping on this one. Are, are you sensing that as well? And I think that's quite yeah, refreshing. Listen, I was, I, I, I joke with his excellency, you know, when I first met him, I don't think I was flavor of the month because I spoke honestly about what I thought about Fury and Garnu. I thought it was a mismatch. I did, you know, and I still don't think it was a great performance from Tyson Fury, but I had to eat my words because Francis, you know, again, whether he won, whether he lost by a round, he, he dropped Tyson Fury and he won or nearly won the fight, right? The lineal world heavyweight champion. So I, I still believe that AJ will show you the levels of boxing in this fight. But listen, I'm, I've been wrong before. I'm an AJ fanboy, you know, and he is the reason that people aren't poo in this fight is because they realize it's a dangerous fight now. You know, they realize AJ should win, but this guy is for real. And, and what I said earlier is key. He has no fear. You know, normally a guy without a boxing background should be going in fighting Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua, but half petrified really, of really not knowing what to do. You know, I saw an uh, Instagram post earlier of him with Guido Cavalera, uh, Cavalera, where he's a heavyweight. He's back sparring already. You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it made me, you know, <laughs> I, I won't say, but, you know, a change of underwear. It was like, Jesus, this, you know, he's dangerous. He's dangerous because he just doesn't really know he hasn't been there. Like he, he's been there now, that, so he's going to be more dangerous. But like he went into the Fury fight, surely without the belief, really, of knowing you could mix it at the elite level of the division. He's done it against the, the supposed best. So he's going to go into the anti Joshua fight going, hang on, I've just beaten the lineal heavyweight champion, in my opinion. So I should be the favourite against Anthony Joshua. So, and, and mentally... This guy's serious. You know, he's a serious, he's a serious guy. So I give him all the respect from his performance with Tyson Fury. Pro pro proved me and a lot of people wrong. But, you know, I, I believe, I mean, you're going to see a real, you know, I always say, you know, it's a fight that you have to watch through your fingers because both guys have extreme power, the kind of power that can switch your lights off like that. And it's going to be electric, electric in Riyadh. August of 2022 in Saudi Arabia, 
you're sitting at the dais with a very emotional Anthony Joshua after he loses to Usyk again. Honestly, in your heart of hearts, and, and it, was, it was hard to watch him like that, and uh, I thought he was unfairly criticized in the aftermath because it was clearly a guy going through a lot and, and maybe his dreams were shattered. And I saw a lot of people, especially in Britain, kind of rip on him and kick him while he was down. In your heart, did you ever think that he could get back to the point where he finishes a year, the following year, 3-0, and with a win like that, on the, on the precipice of getting another title shot? Like, did you think he could do this? Or are you now... Actually yeah, surprised. I've, I've always, been, you know, I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm like his biggest fan. Honestly, like, you couldn't meet a nicer bloke. You couldn't meet someone that has more time for people. Like, bear in mind his position and his achievements. And I know how hard he works. And like, in a change room after that fight, I thought the performance in Usyk two was good. Like, you lost to the pound for pound number one, or arguably the pound for pound number one. And you lost 115, 113, or, or or that kind of score. And you know what? Going into the not the tenth round, I thought you were going to stop him. You nearly had him out of there in the ninth. And 10, 11, 12, Usyk was sensational. Don't beat yourself up. It's a bad style for you. Styles make fights. And that defeat, those two defeats, really set him back mentally. You know, and people talk about him changing as a fighter. Yeah, of course. He's got older. He's got smarter. He's realised that if he just goes in gun ho you know, if he goes in gun ho against France and Ghana and walks onto a shot while he's trading, he get knocked out. You know, but he's rediscovered his confidence, the fire in his belly, the nastiness. You know, what you saw against Wiley, like, it was the first time that I see him spiteful for years. You know, he hit him with a straight right hand to the body in the first round. You could, it was like... It's like someone had just broken a door down. It was like, snap. I was like, oh, my God. And he just looked like a different fighter. So I think it's just funny, you know, like people's opinions, the criticism. One minute you're out, you know, you've got idiots like Thomas Hauser writing articles saying, you know, AJ really needs to retire because, you know, I think that he might have some mental damage. You know, I'm thinking, you've never even spoken to the guy. What are you talking about? And then all of a sudden he comes back like with a performance, you know, that shows maybe he's actually in the prime of his career. No one really says anything, really. So it's like criticism is out there all the time, but he is in a great place. He's really confident. And I said before the Wilding fight, he's going to beat Wilding, he's going to beat Wilder, and he's going to beat Fury. The only thing that's going to change is and Garner replaces Deontay Wilder. Honestly, I, I believe he can beat all those guys. And even with, you know, Ben Davison, they like the Usyk fight now. He really believes, Ben Davison, that AJ beats Usyk. I know that's a tough ass. He's lost twice. But if it has to be him, he's got to throw, go through these guys. I truly believe AJ will become undisputed heavyweight world champion. And only with that last performance do people actually start thinking, yeah. hmm, like... Off the back of a, off the back of AJ Wallin and the back of Fury and Garnu, you telling me you don't fancy AJ against Tyson Fury? I mean, listen, let's. I, I really, I love, I love Usyk, but part of me really wants Tyson to win that fight so we can, we can hopefully move. But look, he's got to get past Ngannou, and just like Otto Wallin, no taking your eye off the ball. I, I have to say, you know, I, I kind of regret saying like my guy Francis, Francis, if only because. <laughs> So no, because AJ is actually one of my favorite fighters of the last decade. Uh, I always talk about on the show his sit down with uh, Louis Theroux is one of the best like mini docs on a fighter that I've seen in quite some time. The side that we got to see of him, I'm such a fan of his, and I really feel like he is treated unfairly in the UK. And I hated the way he was treated after the Usyk fight. Uh, I did an interview. I was in uh, London at the time, and um, I, I really said that I felt bad for him. And if I could just ask for one thing, I, I, I hope he stays with Ben. It seems like he's done such great things with him. I don't like the fit of him in Dallas. I want to see that version of AJ. And I think because we saw that yeah. version on December 23rd, it makes this fight so much more interesting. Like, that's the guy. Mm. That's the guy we all fell in love with post-Olympics and even in the Olympics. And I just think it's the perfect match. He doesn't have to go to Texas. He doesn't have to bring Derek yeah. to him. It's just a great... So if you could tell him, Ariel said so, uh, to stay with oh, Ben. I will do, yeah. I'm sure that would be a big part of the decision. <laughs> Listen, and I love, I love 
Francis as well. You know, he probably was a bit upset with some of the things I said before the fight. But we played I've him the clip, said, by like, the way. We he, when he was on earlier, we played him oh, the clip great. with you. Yeah, so we're just trying to great, stir it up. Great. Yeah. I look forward to seeing him again. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but but I do. I always talk about that meeting I had with him in Vegas. Like we had lunch for two hours, and I found him one of the most fascinating, inspirational people. But AJ has a huge amount of respect for him and his story. You know, um, he is. He is a, he's an incredible athlete. He's an incredible survivor. You know, he's, a, he's an incredible, incredible fighter. But one thing he is, he's a very dangerous man. We saw that, you know, and uh, I can't wait. Like I said, you know, the, the one thing that Fury and Garnu didn't have was when those two giants stand next to each other, you just go, Jesus, like, what <laughs> Look at the size and the shape of these two. Like, and when they've got those little gloves on, this is a fight full of jeopardy. And, um, you know, can't wait. I can't wait to get back out of there. You know, we've got, I've got Callum Smith against Better BF this week. And then we've got the press conference. I fly back, land on Monday, straight to the press conference. And can't wait to see those guys come face to face. You going to Quebec City? Yeah. I love it. What a town. Have you ever been? Yeah, I was there for Tony Bellew oh, against right. Adonis Stevenson. Yes. Yeah, and it's actually the same hotel as well. I saw it today, and you know, I, I posted a picture. Thirteen years since I signed Callum Smith, he was like one of my first fighters that I ever signed from the debut, and it was like at about a time where we were getting a lot of criticism, saying, "Oh yeah, they've got Carl Froch and they've got Kel Brook and Darren Barker, but they've never taken anyone from you know." Pro. I thought, blimey, we've only just started. Give us a chance, and. He was one of the first guys. He actually didn't get selected for the Olympics. He should have got selected for the Olympics, but he turned pro and he, he's, you know, he went and he, he became unified champion um, at 168 pounds, won the, the World Boxing Super Series, and then obviously he's moved up. And I, I've just truly, like, I know I always fanboy all our guys, but I, I really, really see him winning this ad. Wow. You know, I see him knocking Arta better be out. It was a tremendous fight. It was one of the scariest men on the planet. But I just see it. I just see that catching counter left hook and, and I really believe Callum will become a two-division world champion on Saturday. And then he fights Dimitri Bivol. Is that the plan? Yeah, I mean, look, again, the plan for Saudi right. is Bivol better be <laughs> But as I've said to His Excellency... We will be trying to disrupt those plans and we'll see you in April or whenever for Callum Smith against Bivol for Undisputed. But we shall see. By the way, I know you're you're not new to this, but is it weird for you to go to a top rank show? Like this is not your show, right? It's your guy, but it's not your show. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I lost the first bid by about five thousand oh. dollars. It was a really freaky one. Like it was horrible. Um, do you know what? There's honestly one of the greatest feelings in the world is the away day, right? And even though we were involved with the Saudi show, obviously with Queensbury and stuff like that, it still felt that it was almost like an away day. Like we turned up, we, you know, we got our hotels, we, we did the press conference, we were like this as a team. And like, this is the same thing. So you're in the away corner, you're in the bad dressing room, you know, you're in the worst of the hotels and top rank will always look after us. They're, they're great guys, but you're just, you're the underdog and you're the guy that's not supposed to win. And when you get those wins, I've done it with when Kelbrook beat Sean Porter, when, you know, uh, Darren Barker beat Daniel Gill, uh, when Maurice Walker won the world title, you know, uh, on a way sort of uh, at a top rank show as well. Like, there's something special about it. And when Callum Smith knocks him out on Saturday, I'm going to jump over that top rope and we are going to celebrate in the air with Union flag, Union Jack flags. And it is going to be, that is for me, one of the greatest parts. You know, if you've got your team, your football team, your hockey team, and you're away, and yeah. you're just a small group of people traveling to the away day, those victories on the road, there is nothing like it. And that's why I'm going. I'm going because I've been with him for 13 years, but I'm going because I can see him winning and I want to be part of it, you know, with all the Scousers over there, however many there'll be, 40, 50, I don't know. We're going to have a great time, and, and I, I truly believe he wins the fight. I love it. I hope you bring some long johns as well. It's pretty chilly up there. Uh, minus 20, apparently. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, two quick ones, and then I'll let you go. Thank you again. Uh, I have to ask you every time about Taylor Cameron 3. Is there any update on where that stands, and is Croak still a possibility? 
Yeah, we, we've been in conversations with Croke. Um, I think that they're moving in the right direction. I think that's a good thing to say without getting too excited. Um, we're going to speak to um, Chantel Cameron's team. Obviously, Amanda Serrano fights March 2nd on the zone. Um, Chantel Cameron, I think, is the fight that Katie would like. I think it's the fight the fans would like. 1-1, one, one, two tremendous fights. So we'll see if we can get it made. I, th I think it's the right fight for both. But, you know, still got a deal to be done. Uh, and But we'll be doing everything we can to see if we can make Taylor Cameron at Croke Park. And I saw the picture of, uh, or a picture of Lee Wood at the city ground, and there was like a thinking emoji. Is there any chance that that happens next? Yeah, May the 18th is the proposed date. I mean, you know, again, I've made it pretty clear. I want Wood against Warrington at the city ground. We're in talks with the club. They have a big concert on the week after. Come. So we're just trying to get the logistics right. But it's, it, you know, not to put too much pressure on Nottingham Forest, it's in the hands of the club. We've got a fight ready to go, I believe, May the 18th with Wood Warrington. If we can get the logistics done um, and the deal done with the city ground, we would love to make it happen. Wow. And you have to come to that one, Oh, Aaron. my gosh. You know yourself, Eddie. You know, I mean, I'm pretty much the mayor of Nottingham at this point. I mean, they love me. Basically, yeah. yeah. And, and Riyadh. Riyadh, yeah. Nottingham, all the places. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And last one. We'll go back to October 30th. You were on this show. You said, and I quote, AJ Francis, easy money. Do you still stand by that? Yes, I do. You had to you think know, there for I, a second. I, I, you weren't as aggressive. No, because I respect, you know, I respect... I don't want to disrespect Francis because of it, particularly because of his performance against. Like I, I have no problem holding my hands up when something like that happens. I thought he wouldn't win a round against Tyson Fury. You know, he impressed me in so many different ways: footwork, mindset, power, speed. Like, but, and I just don't believe there's many or, or any MMA guys that can transition to boxing. But like, that was an incredible... You imagine if he would have actually got the decision and become lineal world heavyweight champion that night. Like, well, I technically the belts weren't on the line, but... I... But if you, beat, if you beat the man... Sure, you know, lineal, you talk yeah. about the lineal. There is yeah. no lineal belt. Right, I mean, right, you, know, right. you beat the man, you're the lineal champ. I, I'm not a lineal... I, I'm not sure about this whole lineal thing, but if you can use it to your advantage, let's sure. use it. <laughs> sure. um, and I think that, you know, I think that performance... He's really underplayed. I think in any other sport, you know, where someone has never participated at that sport at a professional level and just gone up and, but, you know, you're talking about like, I don't know, like a, a guy who's done a bit of a uh, long jump, you know, just, or, or high jump and just gone, I'll tell you, well, I'll take on Usain Bolt head to head and like nearly beat him. And I, like, it's, it's, it's actually, a freak performance. Talk about Luke Littler and stuff like this. This that that was up there, and he could have won. Like if he wins, it goes down as the greatest win in the history of boxing. That's how close he was, and that's the threat that he brings to this fight. If he beats Anthony Joshua, like you, you talk about a guy who's zero and one. You know, Francis Ngannou on March, you know, in middle March, could be zero and two but could have had great fights with Tyson Fury and Nancy. It's, it's amazing what he's doing. You, know, you really have to take your hat off to him, that he's fighting, in my opinion, I mean, Usyk, certainly two of the top three heavyweights in his first two professional fights. It's incredible. What a story. I love that he's shaking everything up. Uh, I said it on Twitter, but if people love these conversations, you did a great podcast with the great legendary Steve Bunce. On, uh, mm. on BBC. I love that conversation about the history of Matchroom. Really enjoyed it. If I may, maybe a little more Frank Smith next time. It felt like he was getting boxed out by both of you. I mean, he's yeah. wanted to hear more of his story. That is something that he, yeah, that is something. I mean, I do talk much too much, but um, Frank will have his time. Yeah. I no. won't be around forever. Uh, thank you for doing this, Eddie, especially in your state. Good luck the next, what, 20 or so hours? What do we have? Yeah, 20 hours. I've got a timer on my phone, okay. so I'm going to... Oh, it's 7.30 UK tomorrow. Oh, What's mate, the meal? I can't wait. What's the meal? Oh, I don't know. Like, at the moment, I just fancy, like, I know it's a bit boring, but, like, a peanut butter protein shake just to, to get me going. And then, um, yeah, they reckon you should just take it easy, but not going to happen. I can't wait. And then off to Quebec. Enjoy, and uh, we'll see you uh, next Monday. Not me personally, but that's the press conference, right? January 15th yes. in London to officially announce everything. Thank you so much, and congrats on getting it done. Cheers, guys. Thank you. There he is, Eddie Hearn, head man over at Matchroom. Uh, it's a busy time for them, and I love the fact that he is actually going 
to uh, to Quebec City this weekend for that big fight. Uh, you can watch it on ESPN Plus, and you can also watch it on uh, Sky Sports over in the UK. What a time! The Venn diagram. Is it is it Venn diagram or, or Sven diagram? It's Venn diagram. It's Venn, right? Yes. I can't tell if you're being serious. It's the Venn diagram. <laughs> you can also refer to it as the is this Vicera. A, is this a movie joke or something? No. No, I sometimes just... I say it and I'm like, I'm not too confident when it's coming v- out of the mouth. E-N-N. By the way, I didn't want to like make a big stink about it, but why yeah. did we go headphone, microphone, plus oh, microphone? It felt we like a double microphone. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Frankie was over there working for a while. with. with it felt, I didn't want to make him self-conscious, but it felt like well, a double. Du- I, I even told him, uh, Ariel is inevitably going to ask you about this. No. This is what you need to say to him in response. What was, was it? Like, oh, I'll just take the headset off. I'm like, all right. Then that took us down another path. Um, it felt yeah. like cause the last time he joked about being looking like a telemarketer. Yeah. <laughs> now he was doing double mic. I liked it. Um, guys, we I've talked a lot about AJ and Francis, but I have not asked you guys about uh, AJ and Francis. GC, your thought. Where were you when you saw the breaking news come through the wire? I love saying it was, come through the wire because it's a very like 1970s newsroom jargon. I'm, you know, I'm sitting in my living room. I mean, it's just crazy. It's it's like I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around how Francis Ngannou is fighting top five heavyweights in the world. We already saw him compete, take one to the absolute brink of defeat and lose a split decision. And now we're seeing him fight Anthony Joshua, who just had an incredible 2023, and he gets another chance to shock the world. I mean, I can't doubt him this time. Uh, I feel like me and Rick were back here talking like, finding ourselves sort of saying the same things we we did before the Tyson one, but I keep just stopping myself and being like, I can't doubt him for this one. Just can't doubt him. Just have to have faith that he's going to do it again. As of right this second, what are the odds? I believe it's minus 700, Anthony Joshua. Uh, Francis is going to plus 450. And um, is that official or is that like... I mean, you could bet. You can bet. You could bet that. And, it's and, not our friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. They do not have a lineup, but yes. This and what did it open at? Supposedly it opened at like minus 155, but that line was gone in an instant, uh, if it did. Minus uh, 155 for AJ? Well, it's already come back down. This What's it now? I mean, this thing's all over the place. Anthony Joshua, minus 450. Francis is going to plus what? 25. This yeah, mor- I mean, it's all over the this place. This morning, was it in minus 700? Minus 700, Anthony Joshua. I think Joshua uh, they must have heard that Eddie soiled his underwear after <laughs> seeing the sparring Life-life. footage of Nganu and uh, started backing our boy. Okay, your your level of excitement, interest, 12, 15. It, uh, am 20. I right? Or, or, or uh, let me know if I'm if I'm like you know prisoner of the moment. Does this feel bigger, more positive, more excitement than the Fury one? Yes, uh, Francis Ngannou did a lot. Right. Eddie Hearn has nailed it. Right. Eddie Hearn in one breath will say, "My guy Anthony Joshua is going to beat the brakes off Francis Ngannou." Then two sentences later will explain that there's a legitimacy to this fight now because <laughs> Francis Ngannou has proven something in the fight against Tyson Fury to him, to Anthony Joshua, to fans, to show that he can be competitive. And at the very end, he also came around to it. It's the one of the most incredible sporting achievements that I can recall. And if he's able to do it again, if he's able to, in his second professional boxing fight, look capable, even capable, against Anthony Joshua, let alone win the fight, it's storybook. I mean, it's 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 unfathomable. It's truly unfathomable. And he, I think he's right that not there's not many guys on a on an MMA roster somewhere that could do it, if any. It, it felt like last time going into it, the war was already won. It didn't really matter what the outcome of the battle with Tyson Fury was. Like he he got the fight with Tyson Fury, got this massive payday. Now it's like, man, can Francis Ngato actually beat Anthony Joshua? Man, that's that's the perfect way to say it. You have summed it up per- more perfectly than anybody. The story was the bag. It literally, to yeah. the point where they printed gimmick, um, not gimmick, uh, fumble, fumble the, the bag. bag bags. The story was the bag. Now the story is the boxing. And it's a great point. people believe in him. Get get GC out there to uh, Riyadh to put that on the, the promo right Nailed there. Nailed it in get one the- sentence. Frankie, let's stay at the Luxor, baby. <laughs> um, you're 100% right. That's why I said, by the way, like the whole thing about sticking it to the UFC, but that to me that story's done. Now we're yes. now the plane has took off, and and he has put everyone on notice. 
we can't do the receipt thing anymore. We can't do the uh, moral victory thing anymore. This is a real fight, in my opinion. No yeah, one's calling a it a gimmick, uh, an exhibition. Yes. There's a danger. What is it? This is house money now. He already won, right? He already won the game. Now, you can, the record, the boxing record, him, his uh, boxing ambitions, all these things. But he won, right? He he achieved the thing that everybody said he couldn't achieve, that he dreamed of, that he made come to reality, that he manifested. Now it's house money, right? And so now, you know, how how hungry is a real thing, right? Like, that he he's already done the thing that he set out to do. Now doing it again doesn't feel as special, you know? There's not as there's not as much on the line. There's not as much risk on his end. Um, that can be dangerous. That can to, be a dangerous position. To put it into context of just how real of a fight it is, we just talked about the odds, minus 450 for Anthony Joshua, plus 325 for Francis Ngannou. The fight that you just talked about with Eddie Hearn, Arthur Better Bia versus Callum Smith this weekend, a very real boxing fight, Arthur Better Bia Minus 450, Callum Smith, yeah. plus 325, the exact same odds. Yeah. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, do either of you wish his next fight was in boxing? Excuse me, in MMA. Boy, I screwed that up. No. Uh, no. no. I, I, I want to see I want to see another go of boxing. I mean, of course, if he fights in MMA, uh, I'm going to be excited for it, uh, especially because I'm, I'm, I'm almost more curious on who he's going to fight rather than the actual fight itself uh, when it comes to MMA. Uh, but after that Tyson Fury performance, to get an opponent like Anthony Joshua, uh, I'm glad that it's in boxing. If it was John Jones or Tom Aspinall, yes. Anybody else, no. Honestly, okay, crazy question, just just having the conversation. Which fight excites you more, AJ versus Francis in boxing or Francis versus John Jones in MMA? Francis versus John gotta Jones. Be, yeah, got to be John Jones. <laughs> I, I don't disagree, but there is something about this, like the 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 absurdity of this whole story at this point. Imagine yeah. he goes out and knocks out Anthony Joshua oh my Cole. Gosh, the scenes. Yes, <laughs> the scenes. Be so it's crazy. truly it, it's what it's miraculous. It is miraculous what he's been able to do. Truly, it was my feel good moment. I just could not believe that that happened. I still can't believe that it happened, and I can't believe we're now getting a fight with Anthony Joshua. True or false? Francis Ngannou fights. In MMA in 2024. False. Yeah, I think false as well. If you're PFL, are you upset? Yep. How could you not be? Yeah. There's there is something that it did up their... Their stock is up because his stock is up. But Right. How they, much does it continue to rise if he never fights for him? I think he'll fight for them. But they're going to go a year, another year, with a pay-per-view product... Lots of fights happening, and your biggest star, the main attraction, the guy that you won in free agency, the guy that everybody said, wow, they got they were the ones with at the end of it with the prize, is not fighting for you. That's that's significant. Um when he if and when he does come back for them and does fight in the PFL, I'm sure they'll be able to capitalize on it. But let's be real, like the PFL isn't getting a huge benefit out of Francis Ngannou going to box in Saudi Arabia. Like now. If they if there's deals where PFL is more prominent and notable and tied into this because of their own dealings, now I could see some more benefit, some some tangible benefit. But like last time, what was PFL's actual imprint on that fight? What was their footprint? No. Zero. Nothing. Francis didn't even mention them. Honestly, the footprint is, you know, I notice when I'm listening to like boxing podcasts, but they they just mentioned the PFL without even having to explain what the PFL yeah. is. And there's some sort of currency to that, but, I mean, it, it's minimal, right? Uh, it, it is a thing. Like, at the beginning, I would hear people say, like, so he fights for something called the PFL. What is the PFL? And now they just say it like we say top rank or we say matchroom, which I think says something about where they're going, but obviously you would much rather him fight for you. Right. Um, I do think they deserve some kind of credit obviously we don't necessarily know the actual you know finer points of the contract but not standing in his way here they and, want and, they won him because of that yeah he said it he, yeah he said to you today the reason he's happy and the reason yeah. he did this deal with the pfl was because they did not prevent him from doing these things no brainer you don't if you don't do it that way if you don't have him spend this time boxing you don't get him at all he does something else so 
I think they still they made the right call, but I would also still be upset. Like, hey man, you know we kind of had the faith in you, and uh, you got to reward us. And hopefully, come a year for you know a year from now, maybe we'll start having those conversations, and he will be back in the MMA cage, the smart cage. Yes, it is wild though. Like Fury Usyk is going to be some kind of scene, some kind of fight. Who knows about the scene? Um, and then three weeks later. Three weeks yes. later, this is going to happen. Like the fact that it all is happening so close to each other, and in the midst of that, this potential PFL Bellator card, and then the UFC debut, which is going to be very big on March second. Crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, obviously, the one thing they have to work on is just like making the events feel big, you know, and not making them feel void of buzz, hoopla. There, there is something about it. You know, Eddie's talking about the away day for you know Callum Smith. Like, there's just nothing like those those crowds, right? I'm watching Bill's Dolphins last night and it sounds like they're in Buffalo because all these people traveled to Miami um, to cheer on the Bills. Like the, the the crowd does help. It's the reason why we don't like the the Apex so much. So Speak for yourself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just hope that that um, becomes a thing as they put on more and more of these events. Um, but there's something about like... Do you think they hope that? Do you think they care about that? Who's they? Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia. I mean, ultimately, I think the thing they care most about is establishing Saudi Arabia as this this hub of all things sport and entertainment. Um, will the fans ever be in the arena, though? That's that's what I'm. Will the fan meaning is. travel? Yeah. Will they come? Will the fans come? I mean, it's tough. I, I I know I know Saudi Arabia is I think six or seven hours from London. Obviously, it's a hell of a lot further away from America. Um, so I could see, I could see people traveling, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to take some time. It's like, it's like Dubai and Abu Dhabi. It, it took yeah. time to establish them. This we're, we're kind of in the infancy of, of all of this. 100%. And while they've made a big splash by Ronaldo and, you know, all the stuff in football and the golf stuff, it's still, we're, we're talking like less than five years of all of this being a thing. So strategically, if every big boxing fight that you want to go to is happening there. You kind of have no choice, right? If you're a fan who's looking to travel to a show. Or you just say, I'm going to watch it at home. Yeah, right. I'm saying if you're, if you're, if you're to dying travel, to if go to one. somebody who has to go to one, like you, they're putting on the biggest fights right now. So you're, you're kind of. Well, the thing they have to try to convince people is if you're, if you're, if you're earmarking one event a year in the past, a fan from England would say, like, I'm going to go to the Ricky Hatton fight in Vegas or the Tyson Fury yeah. fight in Vegas or whatever the big or Vegas. Or right. Uh, but if you if you want to make that big trip, right, like oh, that yes, trip yes, yes. on a plane six, seven yeah. hours, now they have to convince people, like, the Vegas fights aren't the one that you want to go yep. to. You you want to come to ours. Um, yep. And, and I, I you know, they would know better what percentage of people are coming over from England as opposed to just local people, Middle Eastern people. Um, that, that's all stuff that, you know, remains to be seen, but, uh, very happy for Francis. And it is true. I did an interview. I need to find this clip. I did an interview with, uh, I think it was Joe.ie or it might've been like, I don't remember the outlet when I was in London for clash at the castle, which was August of August slash September when I went to the forest city game and it was right after the, uh, the Usyk Fury rematch. And I said in the, in the clip that like, I, I really think that the UK fans are too hard. Like that was hard to watch. I even did a Spotify live right after that fight where, where, you know, when he threw the belts and all that stuff and he kind of had a breakdown in the, uh, in the ring after the Usyk fight. And then he started crying at the, uh, the press conference with, with, with Eddie sitting right beside him. I've really enjoyed the Anthony Joshua career, the, 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 the highs and lows. I mean, obviously the Ruiz fight was a tough one, but then he came back and thought about a brilliant fight in trying to get back on track. And so I really like I I love this fight. I love this fight so much. I, I love, love this fight, and I and I agree with you regarding AJ. Um, he's this version of AJ is just more interesting than poster boy Instagram model AJ. Yeah, like perfect person. Like, you know, I'm not going to talk about the specific behaviors or condone any of it, but like John Jones is more interesting now than he was when he was choir boy. You know stopping muggers like this is just a more interesting character you see the real human you see the things that that the struggles and you see the successes and you see the roller coaster and this is more interesting i think uh for aj 
I, I'm, I was never re- like, I wasn't a fan when he was just the like cookie cutter guy coming up saying all the right things, super guarded. Like now he's, he's just a guy out there. And I, and I kind of dig that. Did either of you see the Louis Theroux doc? No, I did not. I think what I sent you see? it to you YouTube? Guys. I think I sent it to you guys and you guys ignored me. No, I don't think so. It's usually like a 40% hit rate with the stuff that I send, but it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's tough. I finally got around to the wrestler. Oh yeah. Did you enjoy it? It was good. Great was good. movie. Out of 10? Seven. seven. Whoa, that's low. I feel like. What is this, seven? It's higher than seven, average. Seven's bad. I mean, I feel like eh. seven's a solid score. Good movie. I thought you were going to say 7.58. Yeah, eight. Mm. Just eight for a nine. reference point, where is Interstellar seven. on the good old 11. scale? Oh, wow. There's some people who ride hard for Interstellar, and then there's the other side who hate it. It's, it's a real polarizing movie. They hate it because Never it saw. has so many fans that love it. I love yeah, the so, wrestler. So when you say never saw it, this is why when you have a recommendation or oh, something else, like, it. no, you know, no, it kind of has to come no, over. It's, it's recommended as it. Billy Madison. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> the wreck the wreck goes even further when I have a wreck because I don't have many wrecks. No, oh, this is so good. You need, you need the other things to color it in. But I will watch that. It, it was just such a great side of him because to yeah. your point, it was a very unguarded side. And then he went to go see his aunt who he grew up with and uh, it was just brilliant. And then they gave him... This is something that I've I've talked to people about doing, um, specifically about the fight game. Obviously, Louis Theroux is generational and the greatest to ever do it, um, as far as this medium is concerned. But you know, he 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 did a thing with KSI. He did a thing with Anthony. It's not his main beat. And there's so many interesting characters that, rather than do a sit down, which is what he didn't do, he was with him for a few weeks. And so he was backstage at the Jermaine Franklin fight, and then he went to go see his family, and then he sat down with him and talked about his upbringing and his relationships and and the criticism and all that stuff and it wasn't just like let's sit down for an hour and that's that it was very comprehensive and it was yeah. just tremendous just tremendous so i can't wait would love to have aj on the program that would be fun um maybe when they're uh i mean bo- eddie's on every week let's just make it happen get get, eh, get you know. the call eddie he made he made a crack there saying oh i'm sure he won't care or will care about your uh you know, your, your two cents on who he should train with. But I do believe that I have a point. Um, he did look great with Ben I Davis. I, I think Ben is the one of the best trainers, yeah. Who wins? AJ. AJ. Look, I, I won't make the mistake of completely counting out Francis Ngannou ever again. I will not let you be silly to make that mistake again. But my head says, like, AJ is going to stand behind the jab, jab him to the body, jab him to the head, and just get that done. Like, it does it, – I don't see him as inactive as Tyson was. Like, Tyson's best moments in that fight were when he was really st- standing behind the jab and being active and being aggressive. When he was sitting back and playing the kind of counter game, like, they were just staring at each other. There was not a lot of punches thrown, and it plays into Francis Ngannou's hands. I just don't see – the AJ that fought Otto Valin is going to beat Francis Ngannou for sure. Man, that's what that's the best part. It's not an AJ who is coming off the Usyk loss. It's not an AJ who's looking for a payday to get oh, back I'd on track. I'd be real low on the, on that version of AJ. No, you know what I mean? It, it it's yes. coming off the the probably best version of AJ that we've seen in the last like 3 4 years. That's what makes this so much fun. It's not a a chewed up AJ. What do you think, yeah. GC? Man, I I tend to agree with Rick, but like I said I I I can't fall into the same trap of of doubting Ngannou again. I'm definitely not going to bet on AJ like I did with Fury last time. Oh, you're not going to? No, no way. Okay. Even that is, are you going to bet on Francis? Is, is an accomplishment. Probably. Wow. Oh, like, Francis by KO. Oh, man, what is that? Just to be holding the ticket. Is that they even out have, there? They don't have it yet. But, oh, my gosh. I mean, just to be holding the ticket in case it does happen. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's so <laughs> ridiculous. What do you think that'll be? Like plus 1,000? Yeah, I want to say that's around what it was against against Fury. I mean, I could see it being like, yeah, like plus 700 something. Yo, imagine you had that ticket against Fury and it was even more of a long shot and you're going nuts in the third round when he drops him. That that would have been like me when the uh 
when the Bills uh, ran back that punt yesterday. Yeah, it was a nice one. Oh, jeez, you're really you're really celebrating hard. I before know, the guy the, had completely oh. given up on the team. Was but like you, I'm done. Oh, I wasn't even criti- criticizing oh, that. That's also. Oh, true. what do you mean giving up on the team? I've been a fan of the team since <laughs> freaking 1990. What are you talking? This, you by the way, this you year, said, coming from the guy who well, says like when the team sucks, like you don't have to suffer with them. Yeah, of course not. I'm allowed right. to say this. So what do you want me to fucking do? Not be happy? Let me tell you something. That's the My closest. Was, that's the closest I've ever been to feeling like they won the Super Bowl. It was Sunday is, night. It was cold. It was the winter time. I went to bed and saw them put on t-shirts and hats. I've never felt <laughs> that close to the the idea of realizing the dream of them of seeing them win the Super Bowl. I really th- at night I was like, I think this is how it feels. I think if they could just do it, I'll be the happiest. Not done. This is. I know it's not done. Job's not done. Not but when you done. consider oh, where they were started. in November. When you consider them off that Eagles loss, heartbreaker, watch the whole game, contrary to what you're trying to say over there, uh, and right, then the everything that they had to do. I never said it. I never said the season McDermott was over. had to come in and be like, remember when we were 7-6 and six and we made the playoffs? Yeah, yeah. Tampa Bay, two years ago. Everyone I was there too. It's like, ah, oh, man, what are we going to do with this guy? Fire McDermott. I'd say it was his best. Um, it, was, it was maybe his best game ever yesterday. Defensive coordinator, of course. I feel like that division is you wide shut down open. Tua. The no? division? Yeah. Conference? You mean uh, the conference? Sorry, the conference is uh, wide open. It is wide open. It's down to the Bills and Ravens. But I'm not going to be, by the way, be. I'm humble and Could hungry. Be. I'm humble and hungry. I'm not going to be that guy who's like, I'm not I'm not going to be the, uh, like if I go on Simmons' show, I'm not going to be the cocky Bills fan. I've oh, tried see, that already. This is what I was saying. I felt like a little premature to do. No, I'm just overjoyed. Can, can I not be happy? I'm overjoyed. I'm it's a beautiful I end was, of the season. I was sitting on my Shendo phone yesterday like just watching the all the clips, and I just couldn't get – I mean, I couldn't get enough. I'm rooting. I'm rooting for them. Who do we got, Steelers? Steelers at home, 1 p.m. Sunday. Then if, if Miami beats KC, we get the winner of Houston-Cleveland. If KC beats Miami, finally KC comes to us. Finally, first time in the playoffs after all these years of us going to them. And then obviously if the Ravens win, we have to go to them. But the, it, that win was so big, not just for the AFC East. Who cares? I mean, it's great to win the AFC East, but it's the difference between hosting two playoff games or on the road the entire time. 100%. And, you know, don't let us get hot. Don't let us get hot. Pretty hot. Nah. <laughs> Don't let us get hot. I'm not going to be cocky, but we're, Big we're Josh. It's simmering. It's simmering uh, underneath there. So I just want one. Just want one. Shout this is our- the year, if any year, right? It, it's almost funny how the other year, they're the ones that are like the big dog. And then it's disappointing. I feel like this is the way this to win. The, well, because everyone counted them out. Now they're out of it. And then they come back and then they're just like. Hey, we're here. We're the we're the best team in the uh, in the conference. Everyone counted them out. Oh, everyone's sending me messages about Josh Allen yesterday. Oh, he's not that guy. He 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 crumbles. Yeah, what were you saying? Third and thirteen. Did you see that play? Third and thirteen when he when he was literally surrounded by four guys and there was this much left before the first down and he just willed them into the into the. Uh, How about that play right zone? before uh, halftime where the Dolphins played that soft coverage and just let the Bills get that was like so 10 weird. yards? That was so I, weird. I like never saw an explanation for that. That was that was one of the weirdest plays I ever saw. And then they went to the tight shot of Tua and he was like, what was that? Yeah, see that? Was like, what is going on? Like, yeah. I, I still don't know. And then the Bills almost scored. Should have been a touchdown. My guy, Jimmy Cook. Yo. Dropping that one. I mean, you know, right in the hands. Dude. He's had a couple of bad drops. If I, he's had a great yeah. year. But he's had a couple of bad drops. No, one last thing on the game from a media perspective. Did you guys see when they stopped them at the one yard line right before the end of the half? Yeah. And then they I went to the McDermott. They pushed him back. Yeah. yeah, they went to the McDermott interview, which is kind of rare. You don't always get the coach interview before the half or during, you know, the, or like right before halftime. First half, yeah. And, uh, you know, he was kind of critical of Josh. And I'm surprised that more wasn't made of that. He was like, got to throw it in the end zone. And then they asked him about the two picks. And he's like, you got to make better decisions. I was like, damn, that doesn't this always is, happen. This is like Giannis, you know. Even the even the dudes doing the equipment managing, yeah, are, uh, are on the line here. You got to be better. I about my Falcons yesterday, going up seventeen fourteen, losing seventeen to forty eight. Yeah, that was good stuff. Your boy was upset. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Arthur James James Winston set a knee in it. They scored. Yeah, yeah. He's gone, right? Yeah, fired. Fired. Good call. 
Who's winning tonight? I want Washington to win. Why? Who's going to win, though? Because it's so different. A Pac-12 school, Washington. Last one, right? Maybe has one. Who, if they have, if they do have one, they haven't won in forever. Not a huge Michigan guy. Not a big Harbaugh guy. Future coach like of the Harbaugh. Patriots. Just, just Michigan as a whole. You think? Guy. You think that's how it goes? Well, I could see it happening. Belichick out. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, well, speaking of the NFL playoffs, my friends, what about this transition? DraftKings Sportsbook is an official sports betting partner of the National Football League, and they are bringing you an offer that will help make the playoffs electrifying. New customers can bet $5 on any game and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. And same thing about the Bills. They had the third or currently have the third best odds, but as of 1 o'clock yesterday, they were still not in the playoffs. And thank you so much to the Tennessee Titans. Thank you so very much for that win. That took the money. I, I predicted it. Titans wins. Titans win. We win. Because all the pressure's off their shoulders. All the pressure's on Miami's shoulders for the uh, the choke job. And uh, that's what happened. It was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. When they got stopped on fourth down, I was like, oh, two is going to come back. They're going to go for two. And it's going to be another knife in our heart. Thank the heavens. Maybe, maybe this is our year. Maybe... All that had to happen was a Super Bowl in Las Vegas. Oh, my God. Don't let us get hot. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code DMA. Our new customers can bet just 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the code DMA. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. That's 467 36 Nine. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash football terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions. Terms and responsible gaming resources. Yeah. All right. Um, there wasn't any big show this past weekend uh, to wager on. Like I said, there was just that one boxing event. Uh, but as we did last year and perhaps even the year before at the beginning of the year, old GC's got some futures for 2024. Is that right? That is correct. Much less uh, than years in past. All right, we're, ju- we're jumping right yeah, into it. I love it. No, no tea up there. Uh, yeah, we'll start at the heavyweight division. I've done this the last two years. I guess I'm going to make it a third year. You see the hoodie. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, re- I'm repping the Aspinall hoodie. This feels kind of weird, but Tom Aspinall is like plus 175. Uh, to become the champion, and you're giving me John Jones, 27-1, and one, one of the greatest to ever do it, currently holding the belt, and there seems to be a plan in place for him to fight Stipe Miocic in the summer, I mean, July, like uh, August, June, September. I mean, when, when will he fight him if he, you know, if they do go with that plan? And, and if he fights Stipe, he's going to be like a minus 400 favorite, minus 350 favorite, so... There's a world where this guy fights Stipe, and that's the only time he fights this year, and he retains the belt the whole way through. I know, you know, there's there's a chance that he retires. That's that's a possibility. Uh, but when you're giving me one of the best ever who's already holding the belt, and his next fight he's going to be a massive favorite in, and you're giving me the same odds you gave me last year, plus 450 last year, plus 450 this year, um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to take that. So once again, for the third year in a row, John Jones, heavyweight future. While wearing the Aspinall hoodie, while wearing the Aspinall, I do want to know numbers play. Yeah, no, I understand the odds. The only thing stopping the Aspinall train politics. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I would be worried about holding an Aspinall plus 175 if he doesn't end up getting the shot this year. Plus and, also, and if, interim if, doesn't if count, does, right? Interim doesn't count. Interim does not count. Yeah. If he does, you know, we have all the faith in Tommy Aspinall. John Jones is not an easy out. Like it's going to be a, a coin flip fight on the odds. Um, so, yeah. I wonder though. Then, then up you can there in age with a, a Tom Bet on the fight. Could I do wonder Big though? Edge. Up there in age, coming off shoulder surgery, it, it, it will have been one fight in the span of four years for John against the runaway train known as Tommy Aspinall. Come on, I'm with you. You see me. Ro- you see me rocking the hoodie. No, no, I feel you. Uh, so yeah, interesting. What's going to happen at at a heavyweight this year with all the drama going on? Next up, middleweight. I don't know if I'm just throwing money into a fire again. I've done this the last two years, never even got close to getting the title shot. But I'll do it again. I'm Tashamayev, yeah. middleweight champion. 
Uh, I mean, I feel like he's one win away at middleweight from from getting a shot. Will he fight more than once? Uh, I hope so. I think the talent is there. I think if he gets the shot, uh, he will win. Um, so I will go with him to be the middleweight champion at the end of the year. Next up, who I think is the best welterweight in the world, Shavkat Rachmanov. I firmly believe he is one win away from getting the title. Uh, I think he'll fight sometime in the first few months of 2024. He will win that fight, and then he will be undeniable uh, for a title shot. I feel like the thing that stops this, sort of like you said, you know, politics, Bilal gets the shot, then where do we go from there? Who wins that one? Uh, you know, does the belt holder fight again in 2024? Uh, you know, the scheduling is always the toughest things with these things. Yes. But I think if Shavkat gets the shot this year, he will be holding the belt. I, I do believe he is the best welterweight uh, in the world. Let's go to men's bantamweight. Another man who I, I believe is one of the best in the world, Murad Devalishvili at plus 375. Uh, I mean, he's the number one guy. He's fighting the number two guy next month. I think if he wins that one, uh, he will be undeniable for a title shot at that point, whatever the outcome of O'Malley versus Vera is. Uh, and you have 10 months to book it. Um, I like Marab's odds here. I think he'll be a favorite over Cejudo. I think he can win that fight. Uh, and at plus 375, I like my man from Georgia. I'm a little bit surprised it's that high. To potentially get it done. Yeah. Again. Still out there for the taking. If people feels like politics, it. only thing that can get in his way at this point. This one, the the line did move a little bit. This one is is going to be tougher to come by. So I'm surprised by the big line movement. But I took Umar Nurmagomedov wow. uh, at plus 800. I think the talent's there. I think the skills there. I mean, he he is amazing. They had him slated to fight Corey Sandhagen last year. Um, so they obviously got plans for him. That's the top five fight. Hopefully, something like that gets rebooked and then uh, see what they do for the rest of the year. But I think the talent is there. I think they have plans to try to get this guy uh, into the title picture. Uh, so at this number, I thought it was worth a shot. And then uh, we head over to women's bantamweight. And when you can I ask you a quick a question? Sorry, please. sorry. Please go uh, ahead, please. Uh, how do you feel about betting on two guys in the same division? Yeah, so I've done it before. Yeah, uh, you obviously go less on the on the bigger odds, uh, and obviously one has to lose, um, and they could both lose. I mean, that that could always happen. Uh, but I don't see them making a, a Marab versus Umar fight. Um, so I feel fine with it. All right. Please. We've gone to women's bantamweight. Yes. When you get a chance to bet on one of the parlay boys, I mean, you just got to take it. She's the number one contender. I think she gets winner of uh, Buena Silva versus Pennington. Uh, and I think she gets her belt back. Juliana Pena. I mean, how are we not going to ride with one of our very own? Yeah. Uh, I could see, I mean, also, this one is great because that fight is January 20th. So, you, you know, there's no politics in the way of that. Um, and there's no one else, really. Yeah. Right? At the current juncture, things happen. Things do happen. Crazy things happen. Valentina move up? I don't know. Hmm. Probably not. You she's, guys, we, you know, we were talking about 300. Zhang Alexa do it for you guys? I'm down with that fight. I mean, that's a fantastic fight. I don't what feel is, neat. What does do it mean? I, 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 I would rather see Tatiana Suarez is fighting uh, in February, right? Yeah, Lemos. Give, give me Tatiana and, and Zhang next. I don't want to see. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? The the thing with, like, the do it is, like, you know, I think that's pound for pound number one versus two in the in the women's division. Uh, it gives Zhang a chance to go for double champ. There's a lot of, like, fluff yeah, I around. I don't want to see a, a division tied up. Fight. Fight. Give me Blanchfield Furo a winner. Yep. And give me uh, Tatiana when she beats Lemos. Down for both With all due respect. It's right there. Uh, <laughs> funny you say that. I mean, funny you say that. Uh, Tatiana Suarez, uh, women's yeah, strawweight champion. That's the one. I, mean, I, I think she's going to beat Lemos, and I, I think once she beats Lemos, she's she's undeniable for a title shot, undefeated. Uh, will have beaten Andrade and Lemos uh, in the last six months. Um and I, I do think she's one of the best strawweights in the world. Uh, Zhang is like minus 170 for this. There was there was no chance of me taking that. So uh, Tatiana Suarez, women's strawweight champion. Those are the futures. Much much less volume this this time. I like around. it. No, this kinda, is good. Kind of noticed that uh, a lot of them never even were close to having a chance. Uh, so trying to take ones that I really do think either they're going to get a shot uh, or they're going to be very close to getting one. I think you have a great chance with all of them. I'd probably say that your biggest long shot is Umar, but you you know that. Sure. Right? Sure. 
Um, yeah, so uh, looking forward to this year. And I'm sure at the end of the year, uh, I'll hit like maybe one or two and we'll look back and be like, man, I can't believe XYZ happened. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I mean, have you come across anyone that had Sean Strickland, middleweight champion? No, no one sent me that. Yeah. No one sent me that, but I'd like to know what uh, what they know for this year if, if they do have one of those. Um, all right, great stuff. And speaking of Sean Strickland, before we go, uh, any any takeaways from Ian Gary? Uh, we covered a lot there. I thought he did a great job. Um, I, I know he's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people who want to see him fail and want to see him get his comeuppance. And uh, certainly he has opened himself up. But I don't know. I was curious. Uh, I'm close to the sun on this one. So what did you think, Rick? I, th- <clears throat> I thought he handled himself pretty admirably um you can think what you want of what like the content of what he's saying right like when he's talking about you know what's over the line or you know essentially the same things you could say about sean strickland right what like in the nature of this game is anything off limits uh did i cross the line first did they cross the line first have i welcomed this you can think what you want about that part of it but to be as composed as he was and to handle it in the way that he did, I believe was very mature and the way that I would hope that people would handle it um, rather than like a, a, a unhinged kind of ex- escalation, which I think many people could expect would be well within his right at a certain point. Um, I thought he handled it pretty admirably. I, I liked the way he he comported himself. GC? Yeah, I'm with Rick here. I mean, dude gets an insane amount of hate lately. Uh, so to, you know, handle it maturely is speaks volumes. By the way, Colby versus Ian Gary on Sign IFW. I'm in. there. I mean, I don't even... Uh, in. Yes, in. 100% but in. The, 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 the gutter that we'll be oh, residing yeah. in. Yeah. We're past that point already. Yeah, I mean, we're already in the gutter. That train is out of the station. <laughs> we, we're already there. We live in the gutter now. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Uh, the whole, what, well enjoy while the whole damn thing? The whole damn thing is just parked in the gutter? Yes. Um, all right, well, uh, I am looking forward to all of that. Fun way to start the year. Right back on track. Sometimes there's uh, there's a quiet period. But we're right back on track. We're right back on track after the uh, the two big fights announced uh, last night. We're right back on track uh, following Friday's big announcement that Francis Ngannou is, in fact, going to fight Anthony Joshua. And dare I say, courtesy of our good friends over at Cash App, that's our That's Money moment of the weekend. Thank you very much to Cash App for their support. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store to start saving Today, yes, there it is. The that's money moment of the weekend and of the week. The announcement that Francis Ngannou is in fact going to be fighting Anthony Joshua. Plenty more to come as far as that fight is concerned over the next couple months. Looking forward to that press conference next weekend and a hell of a lot more things happening in the Venn diagram that is combat sports. For now, though, we say goodbye back on Wednesday. To answer your questions, I'm sure there's going to be a lot pertaining to that fight and 300 and all kinds of things. As I said earlier, Callum Smith, who is fighting Arter Betabiev, is going to join us from Quebec City on Wednesday. Also, old friend of the program, Rick, joining us on Wednesday, the KFC King himself. No way. I love that. Mark Hunt, live from Sydney. It has been a while since we've had him on the show. Have we had him on since we came back? I don't think so. Wait, did we? Now, now one's starting to pop into my head. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to, uh, but it's, it's good to have him back. Yeah, it's good to have him back and uh, a few others as well that we're working on. So looking forward to that. Always great to talk to Mark Hunt. Um, He is approaching 50, believe it or not. He may have actually hit 50. Let's see. Did he hit 50 yet? I think he's about to be. We did have him on in uh, July of 2022. Ah, you nailed it. 49, turning 50 uh, in March. July of 2022. When did we come back? Oh, yeah, we came back August of 21. Yeah, all right. So about a year and a half or so ago. In any event, uh, looking forward to that. Great show. Appreciate everyone who stopped by. Thank you very much to Francis Ngannou. Uh, Obviously, 
it's always a treat and he's one of the most talked about fighters in combat sports and he's always very gracious so we appreciate that very very much thank you very much to Ian Machado Gary great stuff from him thank you very much to Bo Nickel as well thank you to uh, Alexander Rakic looking forward to both of their returns at UFC 300 and of course thank you to Eddie Hearn as well can't wait for everything coming up over the course of the year thanks to them thanks to all of you back on Wednesday same time and place as this. 